former assistant coach is accused of molesting young boys. It was a horrific crime in itself, sexual abuse of children. A serial abuser and pedophile. The story that rocked the world and destroyed the image of a football legend. A 10 year old boy was being sodomized. Everyone thought he was guilty. It's pretty disturbing. But one man questioned the narratives. Somebody out there has got to have the guts to tell the truth about this. After 10 years searching for the truth, he tells us what really happened. Jerry Sandusky is, in fact, innocent. Sparrow Avenue presents Finding the Truth, Jerry Sandusky, with special guest John Ziegler, streaming live May 21st at 9 p.m. on The Spiro Avenue Show. Oh, welcome to Spiro Avenue. It's a big one tonight. Normally, I like to give you a nice, lovely introduction, but we're going to get right to it. We're going to get into the meat and potatoes because, let's face it, there's a lot of meat and potatoes tonight. This is going to be a little bit different for us, and I'm looking forward to it. So let's start with a little philosophical lesson. I have a very educated audience. I trust that you're all brilliant. So we're going to start with a little definition of Occam's razor, a little bit of a reminder for the many of you that already know this but may need a little refresher from time to time. So it's this 14th century philosophy, right? And Occam's razor suggests that essentially of two competing theories, the simpler explanation of an entity is to be preferred. So in other words, if there's two potential explanations that could account for all the facts in a situation, two ways that something may have occurred, generally the simpler one is the way to go. It's the more likely scenario. I like to use the example of a flash in the sky. You see a big flash in the sky. Your kid tells you they see a flash in the sky, and the kid is convinced that it's a UFO. Maybe a bad example now because we just heard confirmation that UFOs do in fact exist, but more likely it's a bolt of lightning. That's the more likely scenario. It was probably not an extraterrestrial flying through the sky, especially if there's clouds, thunder, and that, okay? Occam's razor would say it wasn't the UFO. The more likely explanation, it's a bolt of lightning. There's no better example that I can think of with Occam's razor than anybody in any criminal case that has a multitude of accusers. We're seeing it now with Deshaun Watson. At some point, once you hit the 23rd, 24th, 25th accuser, does that presumption of innocence, just in the public opinion, not in the court of law, which is retained, at what point does that begin to chip away? And there's no better example in this context than the Jerry Sandusky case, which we will be revisiting tonight. But let's just run down the list with Jerry Sandusky. If you look at all the components and if you want to apply Occam's razor to that. So if you look at them side by side, the potential scenarios, Door number one, Jerry Sandusky is guilty. Story's over. We're done. That's the explanation. He was accused, tried, convicted. We're done. Story's over. Door number two, you have to make a myriad of assumptions that seem outlandish. Let's name just some of them. You could go on for 50 of them. 26 accusers made it up. That's a big one. The jury got the verdict wrong. Penn State University wrongly fired Joe Paterno, their legendary coach. Penn State University wrongly paid out approximately $100 million. A Pulitzer Prize winning reporter got the whole story wrong. Jerry Sandusky was railroaded. And Jerry Sandusky is, in fact, innocent. That's a lot of assumptions. And Occam's razor would tell you, it's not a law, but it's a guiding light. It's a North Star. Occam's razor would tell you that Jerry Sandusky must be guilty. He was arrested in 2011. He was convicted in 2012. His name is synonymous with sexual predation of children. Honestly, only the Catholic Church controversy can invoke the same sense of dread when it comes to powerful people squashing crimes against children to protect the nefarious acts of adults. What kind of incredible conspiracy would have to exist For Occam's razor's guiding light to be wrong, to lead you astray, it seems insurmountable. There's too many things. It's too big of a conspiracy. There's too much going on. It's like, you know, Roger Stone with the JFK thing. I think he was probably whacked by the government, but he's got too many cooks in that kitchen. He's got 17 different agencies involved. It's too much. Seems that way with Jerry Sandusky. And a lot of people would argue the only reason to even talk about Jerry Sandusky ever again is to use him as a cautionary tale a dangerous lesson to be learned, a way not to go, 
a, a warning sign for people in leadership everywhere. And that is what we've been sort of conditioned to expect and uh, understand. Jerry Sandusky's guilt was resolved without question years ago. It's done. There's nothing more to talk about. We may have a different take on it tonight. And I'm going to have this gentleman make the case. His name is John Ziegler. I think he is a man that will, if you keep an open mind, which I recommend with anything, will challenge everything you think you know about Jerry Sandusky and the case that landed him in prison, the same prison cell he sits in right now as we sit here talking. This man doesn't think that Jerry Sandusky is innocent. He doesn't have a theory that could open a door of potential innocence. He says he's positive that Jerry Sandusky is innocent, 100% positive. So John Ziegler is fresh off a flight from Los Angeles this morning. He is the host of the new With the Benefit of Hindsight, one of my favorite podcasts in recent memory, senior columnist at Midiite. Happy to have you, John. Welcome to the Spiro Avenue Show. Wow. I have to say that of all the many, many interviews I have done on this topic, including on the Today Show and the Piers Morgan Show on CNN, that is by far the most interesting intro I have ever received. And I'm not 100% sure where you were going with that because I'm an Oxum's Razor guy, too. And I would like to address a couple of things in your intro real quick. Go ahead. Uh, because cause I think that would lend important context for where I'm coming from here and where we're going during this, I'm sure, will be very interesting and extensive interview. I would suggest that the Oxum's Razor people should look at the Penn State Sandusky case. And let's be clear. The only real reason why we care about Jerry Sandusky is because it destroyed the legacy of Joe Paterno, and it also landed uh, three Penn State administrators in deep legal hot water, two of which were convicted of misdemeanors, went to prison, one of which, the former president of Penn State, Graham Spanier, is still fighting a misdemeanor conviction and may end up very likely going to prison very soon for something he had absolutely nothing to do with, even if it happened. But I would suggest if you look at Oxum's Razor, or use Oxum's Razor to look at the entire Penn State situation. Oxum's Razor is on my side because what you are supposed to believe, here's what you're supposed to believe, and this is what the news media bought in three days back in November of 2011. In three days, we bought this idea that Jerry Sandusky, famous defensive coordinator, revered local legend who was beloved by the community, not just for his football coaching, but because he ran this massive, incredibly successful charity, The Second Mile, had actually been systematically abusing effectively teenage post-pubescent boys who were all heterosexual, we now know, for about 40 years. And he was getting away with this without any concerns whatsoever. And he was enabled in doing this by a, a, a football program that was thought of to be the most pristine of all college football programs, headed by a guy, Joe Paterno, who by every measure was the most character-driven top football coach of his era. There's no question that, that was his reputation before this, including the Penn State administrators I just referenced. They were in the same boat as far as their reputation. So... I, if Oxum's razor is used in this case, it the media's version of this fails immediately because we're supposed to believe that there was this massive cover-up for no apparent reason, including after Jerry Sandusky is no longer a coach at Penn State. And we're also supposed to believe that at times Jerry Sandusky is a criminal mastermind to the nth degree but he is also such a moron, he could not answer the question that Bob Costas famously asked him, are you sexually attracted to young boys without pausing, asking the question again, and then finally, what seemed like an eternity later, finally saying, no, I'm not sexually attracted to young boys. That makes no sense. And I'll tell you, I'll finish the Oxum's Razor uh, point on, on this uh, issue. You know, there's been many depictions of this story in the mainstream news media, all of which are garbage. But one of one of the biggest pieces of garbage is HBO's movie, which stars Al Pacino as Joe Paterno. And the Oxum's Razor analysis of that movie 
is hilarious and and very telling because the the narrative, the very very short narrative of the Paterno movie on HBO is that Joe Paterno forgot that Jerry Sandusky was a pedophile. I think that's a pretty accurate assessment of what their narrative is. That he when he got old, you know, he was in his almost mid eighties when this story hits. He just simply forgot that Jerry Sandusky was a pedophile. And that's their way of somehow explaining the inexplicable route that this story took uh, in order to make it make some sense. Ironically enough, I think they were kind of in the, in the, in the right church. They were just in the wrong pew. I think it's what close, what's closer to what happened here is Joe Paterno in his old age forgot that Jerry Sandusky was not a pedophile and in his old age was convinced that he could possibly be one by people very close to him, including his own son, Scott Paterno, including the prosecution, including Mike McQuarrie. And that is one of the many key things to what, to what happened here. But one last point on, on your intro. And to understand this story, Michigan, I know Mich- you're Mich- obviously you're a Michigan State guy. I find it fascinating that a Michigan State guy has flown me all the way from Los Angeles to talk about this story when no Penn State person will. And I would like to get into why that is. Uh, Because it's very telling. You need to understand, to understand the rest of the story, you need to understand the perverse incentives that were created from the beginning, specifically among Penn State University and people who are fans of that university, alumni of that university, fans of Joe Paterno. Everything flips upside down. I have likened it to the North and the South Pole. Imagine if, if you flipped the Earth upside down. That's basically what happened. In, in 24 hours, on November 9th, 2011, maybe it was 36 hours if you're you know, being more accurate about it, but in a very short period of time, the North and South Pole of this story flips when Joe Paterno and Graham Spanier get fired, and now all of a sudden, Penn State is seen as effectively pleading guilty to everything that's been in the news the previous three days. This firestorm has exploded out of nowhere, this Jerry Sineski story. And once Penn State is seen as pleading guilty, why, God, why would they fire the great Joe Paterno if he wasn't, if he, if, my God, not only does it mean Paterno's guilty, that means Jerry Sineski must be guilty. In fact, he's so guilty, we don't even need to worry about the allegations against him. Instead, we're going to focus on Joe Paterno. That's the key moment in this case, is that all the focus that should have been on Jerry Sandusky instead is focused on Joe Paterno through the prism of Penn State pleading guilty in the middle of a panic, a panic. And and I think we've seen in the last year plus, people do not make good decisions, especially leadership, in the middle of a panic. And once they become invested in a narrative created by their hasty decisions and a panic, they can't go back because then they are admitting they screwed up, they were wrong, they were dumb, they were cowardly, and all the damage that ensued thereafter is on them. And so the number one thing you need to understand about this story is get it out of your minds that somehow... The Penn State firing Joe Paterno is a sign that Jerry Sandusky must be guilty. In fact, it's the key to how this whole thing happened because no one cared about Jerry Sandusky's guilt because the Joe Paterno story was so much more interesting, especially to the news media. Joe Paterno was the star. Joe Paterno was the celebrity. Jerry Sandusky was just the vehicle to get there. And, and and that's why I was guilty of this myself, Justin. I I made a huge mistake at the beginning of this. I have no connection to Penn State for people that don't know me. I, I went to school at Georgetown. I live in, in the Los Angeles suburbs. I, I really have no allegiance whatsoever. I grew up in Pennsylvania, but I, I was a Notre Dame fan growing up. Sorry, Michigan State fans. Uh, you know, and, and by the way, you didn't win the national championship in 1966. We'll talk about but, that later. Okay, right? But... Uh, the, but <laughs> But anyway, uh, my my point is that um, I have no allegiance to Penn State, but I even I made the mistake of being totally distracted by the paternal angle of this story. Um, And, you know, I have criticized Scott Paterno. He and I hate each other's guts. 
Uh, and he's in you know, episode three of our, our podcast with the benefit of hindsight is electric because we play a phone call between me and Scott Paterno that is just mind blowing after I interviewed Jerry Sandusky in prison, which really exposes Scott Paterno's real agenda here and how he cannot possibly admit that he was wrong in immediately coming to the conclusion, even before Joe Paterno was fired, that Jerry must be guilty, even though he had no clue. He had not a clue about the facts of the case. He didn't know any of the accusers. He didn't know Jerry. He had never had a conversation with Jerry Zadesky. I have equated Scott Paterno's strategy, since I, I, I'm pretty sure he considers himself to be a strategic genius. You know, if, if you think about this in World War II terms, and he, you know, and Scott thinks of himself as Winston Churchill, you know, there, there in London, he has a choice. Does he fight the Nazis in Europe? which would be Jerry Sandusky, or does he fight the Nazis in London, which would be Joe Paterno? <laughs> and for some reason, Scott decided, let's fight it in London. We're going to cede all of Europe immediately. We're going to give you all of Europe. We're going to put up no fight in Europe. <laughs> and Jerry is guilty. Come and get us, which was idiotic well, from a strategic I, standpoint. I, mean, I can speak for my own experience, too, and I was the biggest critic of that institution for years. I mean, half a decade before finding your work and beginning to dig into, you know, a little bit deeper. I think there's so much there. There's a lot to unpack and we'll get there. I will say just for my own personal context, my first time going to happy Valley was for a Penn state, Michigan state football game in 2010. The last game of that regular season, Michigan state won a share of the big 10 title in that game, winning that game. The perception of Paterno for my two days in that town, it's everything that you hear. And you heard back then, he was a god. He was at such elevated status. Had people going to the games with the glasses dressed up to him. He's, he's an almost mythic figure, even though he's still the active head coach of that team. So when he is fired by the institution that propped him up, that, that made him this guy, that, that seemed to defer to him in so many ways, that is exactly, for me, the affirmation I needed to say, look, I, this story looks bad to begin with. He's clearly, Jerry Sanders, he's clearly guilty if Penn State's throwing the God overboard. This isn't some middle manager in a company that you're, you know, a sacrificial lamb. You would never put Joe Paterno's head on a stake if it wasn't obvious. You're, that make, Jerry you're making my point. Right, I, 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 I agree. And, and, and just on the God thing, the God thing is so important because it's the prism through which the media sees all this case. And I, I have a lot of uh, metaphors and analogies that I use to explain what really happened here. One of my favorite, because I do think it gives people a good understanding of how this went down, is to use the religion analogy with regard to the Catholic Church scandal. The news media, and I'm sure people like you, maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong, immediately saw this, this movie, if you will, and said, wait a minute, we've seen this before. Joe Paterno is the Pope. The administrators are the Cardinals covering this all up. Jerry Sandusky is a pedophile priest. The Penn State football fans are the Catholic parishioners looking the other way, afraid to indict their sacred institution of, of Penn State football. That all made sense to people, except it's bullshit. Okay, it, it's not true. It's, it is a prism through which people saw this because it was easy. It made no sense for a lot of reasons, one of which, by the way, is if Joe Paterno was so damn powerful, and I will agree, at times he absolutely was, how does a, a guy that powerful get fired uh, a week and a half after being the all-time winningest coach in the history of college football over a cell phone that gets delivered to his home by a carrier? Uh, how, 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 how is that? How is that superpower? I, how, how, I is that, it, how is that a god? Well, that's the point, though. It must have been so egregious. No. no the, the, I'm the, telling you that's where I landed. No, I'm, no, I'm I know. you in 2011. Right. And I'm telling you that the panic was so great. And the perfect storm, The fir one of the things uh, I'm going to say a lot is perfect storm. This whole story has a perfect storm of circumstances. One of them is... That Joe Paterno is old, and while the team is having a good year in 2011, and they had been better than they had been in the early 2000s when it was there was a lot of pressure for Joe to leave, that there had been a lot of resentment inside Penn State about how we're going to get rid of Joe Paterno, and specifically the vice chairman of the board of trustees, John Surma, 
who was very close to the governor, Tom Corbett at that time, saw this as an opportunity. Never let a crisis go to waste. And he saw this as the opportunity to get rid of Joe Paterno. That's, that's, pretty, and, cyn- that's pretty cynical. Uh, no, no. Even I'm calling you cynical. Everyone <laughs> close cynical. to this case uh, who no, uh, was involved, including Graham Spanier, believes that that's exactly what happened. They here. probably <laughs> thought Sandusky was. No, no, I'm not. Saying, oh, no, no. Let me be clear. And yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because you also used the word conspiracy in your intro. And I don't. I know. I think you know me well enough to know I am an anti conspiracy theorist. I don't think human beings are nearly smart enough uh, or competent enough to pull off anything more than a two-person conspiracy. And and I am not alleging a massive conspiracy here. I am act I am alleging that a whole series of groups of people acted in their obvious self-interest in a way that created a perfect storm of circumstances that allowed and enabled this massive injustice to occur. And to be clear, you said, I'm, I'm positive of it. It's not just that I'm positive of it. Once you get into the details, it's not even close. And I'm hardly the only person that has come to the same conclusion. In fact, almost everybody I know that has objectively looked at this in great detail has come to either my conclusion or they have couched their opinion politically like Malcolm Gladwell did in talking to strangers using much of my work, including one of the key findings, which is that the date of the McQuarrie episode is still wrong after all these years in a way that totally fundamentally changes the entire story. But chapter five of talking to strangers, Malcolm Gladwell's last best-selling book reads like someone who is about to make the argument that Jerry Sandusky is innocent. He just doesn't have the guts to do it because he's got a lot to lose. He's Malcolm Gladwell. uh, Mark Pendergrass, a very well-respected author, written like 14, 15 books. He's written a book called The Most Hated Man in America. Again, partially using my work. There's a chapter about me in that book where he concludes that Jerry Sandusky is almost certainly innocent. Uh, I mean, we have interviews in in our podcast with the benefit of hindsight with Gary Schultz. Gary Schultz is one of the three Penn State administrators who got convicted of the alleged cover-up, yet he's now on the record in his first interview that he's ever done about this entire case. He did it with me for four hours. He now believes Jerry Sandusky is innocent. Two former members of the Penn State Board of Trustees, Bob Capretto and Al Lord, very well-respected people, titans of business, reputations to defend. These are not anything close to crackpots. They are on the record in interviews with me saying that they believe Jerry Sandusky is innocent. And it's not just a feeling. They they have had access to all the documents over the last 10 years that, it, that have transpired at Penn State. Bruce Heim, the founder and funder of the Second Mile Charity, has changed his position now. He did an interview with me saying Jerry Sandusky is, in fact, innocent. We've, we've got so many other people that have in the same boat. John Snedden, former NCIS agent, who investigated this case for the federal government because Graham Spaniard's a federal uh, uh, security clearance was up for renewal after the scandal hit. Snedden was brought in by the federal government. He interviewed more people in this case that were critical than Louis Free did for the Free Report. He concluded not only was there no cover-up, there was no crime. Well, let's get to this, John. So there's, in your orbit, yes, there may be a a pervasive feeling of Jerry Sandusky is clearly innocent. I think you'll concede, and I'm going to show you a little example. I think you'll concede that generally on a global. Oh no, like, sure, the public. You're in the minority. In the, in the public, I mean, in a, in a minuscule minority. Well, let's get but let's the, get to that. Then I'm going So what we did for this show, I un, you know, just uh, we solicited a two to three question survey of people. <laughs> I, I posted it publicly, I, I soliciting this, but they had no idea what the topic was. They didn't know if I was going to ask what their favorite candy bar was until they were asked the question live on the spot. So we chopped it up a little bit. They were asked a couple questions about this case to get sort of a feel. This was just a scattershot. Let's snatch the public. We didn't hunt anyone down. We we gave it to the people that came to us basically with no information whatsoever. So, Ben, let's play that. And this just gives you an idea, I think, where most of the public stands on this case. (laughs) Question one. Who is Jerry Sandusky? Uh, He's... 
former disgraced coach and all around terrible person. Penn State coach who liked to touch boys. Sandusky was the defensive coordinator for Penn State in the, I want to say, 80s to 90s, 2000. Uh, and he is a pedophile. He was the assistant coach under Joe Paterno at Penn State that got in trouble for sexual abuse of minors. Oh, gosh. The uh, assistant football coach at Penn State that um, I'm not going to say did because I don't have the proof. Um, but I know enough to know that there's some doubt as to uh, what actually took place. Question two. Do you have any doubts on whether he was guilty? If I had to bet money, <laughs> um, I would I would bet yes. I personally don't. Um, no. No, not at all. Uh, I have no reason to believe that he's not guilty based on uh, all the information that's out there and what we know now. So I would say, uh, yes, he's definitely guilty. No doubts at all. I'm certainly open-minded. Uh, I went to law school myself and have some uh, ability to uh, see all sides, if you will. Uh, but yet, the evidence as it's been portrayed in the media, rather damning. Question three. Did Joe Paterno participate in a cover-up at Penn State? I think it is fair to assume, with what we know, that yes, Joe Paterno did know certain things that could have either prevented some type of terrible uh, incidents to minors? Absolutely. All signs point to yes. In my opinion, it's been a while since I've combed through the facts and everything, but yeah, last I, last I left that, yeah. Joe Paterno knew uh, that there were probably things that should have been investigated further. Pretty sure it was the assistant coach that said he walked in on seeing something. Uh, I, I Something about that guy never seemed right. I didn't believe him. Yes, he was told uh, about the information and he tried to hide it by not taking the information to the uh, powers that be. So, I mean, basically that was non non-scientific study, I concede, but six people that we solicited for this, they didn't know going in anything about it to do any, you know. Were they all Michigan shows. State fans, by the way? No, no, it was actually uh, <laughs> four of them, I think, were Michigan fans. A couple by the way, I'll fans. take that jury. I, I, can, I, can win, I can win with that jury. Wow, they seem pretty convinced. No, no, right? I, I, you gave you give me that jury, I can win. You like that two of the six were somewhat open. Well, there was then. one. There was one that for sure I can get. The yeah. guy that doesn't believe Mike McQueer. Well, you only need one. That's yeah, right. Right. <laughs> right. If you give me, if you, I, I can win with that jury. <laughs> so I mean, but here's this is the idea. It's just obviously non scientific, but I think that is a representative example. Sure, a hundred percent agree. Hundred so percent. But that doesn't mean anything because I guarantee you, none of those six people know the name Alan Myers. Okay, we'll who was the boy we'll, in the shower? We'll get to I Alan. guarantee you, they don't know any of these accusers. We'll get to I Alan Myers. I guarantee they don't know about the McQuarrie date issue. I guarantee they don't know about Jerry Vasinuski's medical records. Well, all six of those, all six of those people are watching the show right now. They told me so uh, on the way. All right. Out well, of that. I, so, I will be very so curious whether or not I can I can flip at least one of them. By oh, the yeah, end of the we'll, show. we'll see if you can hang that jury for us <laughs> in, the, in the retrial. That uh, very unofficial and off the books. But this is what I'm getting at. Look, it, it's again, it's a fait accompli. We all know he's guilty. Okay, but you're that's why this happened. I but this is let me get to it, John. Calm down. I, I know you know it's it was a long flight and you got some energy, you got a good nap in that Royal Park Hotel. I got married in it's a, a comfortable bed, I would know. But I, I want you to lay it out for me. This is where we all are. You have your orbit that's an exception, it's an outlier. But most people land here. He's clearly guilty. How did we get there? If this is totally wrong, there's not just you think there's holes in the story. It's completely wrong, and it's obvious it's not even close, as you said. Not even Jerry close. Sandusky's clearly innocent. Not even close. Explain the disparity. I know there's a lot to it, but what, give me like the biggest two or three reasons <clears throat> we got here. How did we miss the mark so much in your mind? Because of the initial panic. Once everyone gets invested in a narrative, especially the news media. You know, a couple of the people in your, in your mini jury said, well, based upon the information I have, well, where are they getting their information? They're getting their information from the news media. Well, let's dispel and, it then. Uh, so let's, uh, let's, let's, let's go. Here's the biggest thing, John. Okay, so mm -hmm. we'll try to give this some structure. To me, the biggest issue with any case like this, Cosby, Deshaun mm -hmm. Watson ongoing now, obviously lesser charges, but still, it's the volume. 
It's the volume of accusers. Right. You can convince me with if there's no smoking gun of anybody potentially being innocent if it's he said, she said, or mm-hmm. it's, it's one accuser of, of, of an individual. Mm-hmm. When you get to that double-digit count, I know there weren't 26 people at trial, mm-hmm. but there were 26 people, correct me if I'm wrong, paid Ac- settlements. Actually, there were 36, 37 people that got paid settlements. Okay, well, we'll have to refresh Wikipedia next time before we okay. have in. But it's a, it's a large sum. One hundred and thirty so, plus million dollars, significant in excess of one hundred million dollars. So that mm-hmm. is the hurdle to climb. There's a lot that we can say about all the other things we talked about. The razor, okay. Mm-hmm. The biggest thing is the volume. Mm-hmm. So you have to, if you're going to make the case that you're going to make, I would think you have to chip away at that mountain because you got a mountain of accusers. Mm-hmm. So you can talk about the motives acting in their self interest. Mm-hmm. You can talk about panic. We're in the news for all the wrong reasons. Those are all valid. I'm not saying any of them are invalid whatsoever. But at the crux of it for the public, for Joe Public, I used to be one of those people that were, didn't look that deep into this. It's the volume. It's the accusers. So mm-hmm. can you go through why does that mm-hmm. not hold the weight that it appears to on its face? Well, I'm not sure that I've made clear that at the beginning of this, it did for me. I believed that Jerry Sandusky was guilty at the beginning of this. I was only interested in the Joe Paterno Penn State cover-up angle. I, I, at the time, I was a documentary filmmaker. and was very interested in doing a documentary film about this. Couldn't have cared less about Jerry Sandusky's guilt or innocence, except how it related to was there a cover-up at Penn State and was Joe Paterno somehow nonsensically involved in this? Because it never made any sense to me at all. I've covered college football, pro football. I grew up around Penn State. I mean, it was in the Philadelphia suburbs, but I was very familiar with the program. I've coached high school football in two different states. I've written a book about a high school football team in Ohio. I know the culture exceedingly well. None of this story made any damn sense. <laughs> Just from you know, a blink, you know, to use a, uh, a Malcolm Gladwell term, from a blink perspective. Now, that doesn't mean it can't be true. But there should be some evidence and some logic to it. So just to be clear, at the beginning, I was right there with the vast majority of the public because that volume is is powerful. But when you look at the timeline of how that volume was created, it tells an exceedingly different story, especially when there's a pot of 130 plus million dollars at the end of the rainbow. Because I think, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think most people's perceptions here is that a bunch of seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old boys who were abused in fairly recent time all came forward at the same time and said that Jerry Sandusky abused us and that that created this cascade or avalanche effect of all these other accusers. That seems to me to be the the most common perception. That's not even close to what happened. It's not even close to what happened. You need to understand that for the first two years of this investigation, a, a attorney general investigation, the state of Pennsylvania, with all the power of the state behind it, investigates Jerry Sandusky with it, with a grand jury, a grand jury gives you unbelievable amounts of power. You can bring anybody you want into a private room in front of a grand jury, put them under oath, throw anything you want up against the wall. If it sticks, great. If it doesn't, no one, you know, no one ever sees it again. And and we move on. It's an incredible tool for the prosecution. For two years, this thing is ongoing, and they get nowhere. Nowhere. They have one accuser by the name of Aaron Fisher, who at the time of the grand jury was a 15, 16 year old, no longer little boy, uh, who had a, a, a lot of credibility problems. So much so that I am convinced that Sandusky and his defense team were overconfident about what they were facing. They thought this was one storytelling kid uh, with no credibility whose mom was clearly out for money, and they didn't, for two years, it went nowhere. Now, was, and, real quick, was uh, Aaron Fisher the reason they were doing the investigation in the first place? Yes, it was Aaron, his Fi- Aaron Fisher in late 2008 
at effectively the age of uh, 14 years old, tells his high school, not the police, he tells his high school, uh, Central Mountain High School, where Jerry Sandusky, let's be clear, is not a god. He's an assistant volunteer high school football coach. All right. This is now uh, 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 well after he's retired from Penn State. He's no longer in college coaching. He's a, he's a has been from a coaching perspective. All Aaron Fisher knows of Jerry Sandusky is that he is a goofy guy who runs a charity, doesn't even drive a nice car, and he's the assistant coach who doesn't even get paid at his high school. This is not a god, okay? Aaron Fisher was at most six years old the last time Jerry Sandusky coached a football game at Penn State. That is incredibly important for the narrative here because the the essence of the narrative is the reason why none of these boys said anything was because, again, going back to the Catholic Church metaphor, that, oh, my God, the fear of Jerry Sandusky and the specter of Penn State football was just so great. That's what it, Mike Gillum said. Right, right. Well, Mike Gillum's a quack. I mean, I mean, in Mike Gillum, for I'm guarantee most people don't know, was Aaron Fisher's therapist. He was also the, which is unbelievable, the co-author of his book. He lost his state license or not or his state contract because he co-wrote Aaron Fisher's book, Silent No More. The number one thing, if you're interested in why Jerry Sandusky is innocent, the number one thing I ask you to do is to read Aaron Fisher's book. I actually gave out copies of his book at a press conference in 2000, I guess it was 16, uh, outside of one of Jerry's, or maybe 15, uh, outside of one of Jerry Sandusky's uh, appeal hearings like, to the media. I, 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 I pleaded, please read Aaron Fisher's book, and I gave out copies of the book. This is the book that should prove his guilt because the the most credible accuser in this case has to be victim number one, Aaron Fisher, because he's the only accuser for two years. And it's not until they stumble upon, and I mean stumble upon, the story of Mike McQuarrie in late 2010 that all of a sudden, Everything changes. Now, I'm going to pause you there because we have some media on Aaron Fisher that I want to get to. I want to have Ben throw up there an interview with Chris Cuomo at the time of ABC, famously now at CNN. That's a, uh. it's another story for a different day. So this was an interview that he did on national TV with Chris Cuomo of ABC News at the time. This is victim number one, Aaron Fisher, talking publicly about his situation. It was about a nine, ten minute interview. We cut up about a minute of it. So, Ben, if you can throw that up just to give some context here. But we have never seen or heard from the boy who started it all. My name's Aaron, otherwise known as Victim One. But Aaron Fisher doesn't see himself as a victim anymore. He is a track star who says he spent close to half his life trying to outrun Jerry Sandusky. A victim means people feel sympathy for you. I don't want that. I, I would rather be somebody who did something good, like a hero or something. Aaron Fisher is now 18 years old, coming forward with a book called Silent No More, the story of what it took to bring down Sandusky as a boy living in a small town where so many work for and worship Penn State. I didn't think anybody was going to believe me ever. Wasn't easy. No, not at all. I was kind of thinking that he was going to get off scot-free with this, and then I'm just going to be another kid in the front page of the newspaper that has a big liar stamped across his forehead. And, you know, that is a believable tale, I think, sort of on its face. That, and you mentioned, you, you know, your effort to, I, I guess, debunk it is the weight of Penn State and the weight of this, this godlike figure. And, you know, I, I think that's the big Hold hang. Hold on a second. Did, yeah. that guy, did that guy sound like he was talking about the most horrific episodes of his life? Being sexually abused. I'm not qualified. But, but, no, whoa, 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 yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. He's smiling in that interview. He's not looking at Chris Cuomo at all. You didn't play the most interesting parts where he's uh, referring to Jerry Sandusky as a teddy bear. Uh, there are no tears. There's no anger. There, there is. And, 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 Come on, you could people. I, I well, smiled wait, when a girl turned me down well, uh, wait, for the prom in well, high school. Hold I wasn't on a second. Happy. Compare, compare what you just saw there yeah. to the interviews. Uh, and and the testimonies 
from the gymnast in the Larry Nasser case. And I realize, you know, that's a Michigan State connection. Uh, and by the way, I don't believe there was a Michigan State cover up of Larry Nasser. Uh, and and for because I don't think there was any incentive to cover up for a gymnastics coach or a, a physician at, at Michigan State. No one gives a crap about uh, college gymnastics. Uh, nor do I believe there's good evidence of a, of a cover up there. But Larry Nasser was guilty. Nasser's as, guilty. Right? Guilty. Okay, Nasser's guilty as hell. But yeah. but but there's no there's no lack of tears or or anger among the women in that case. And the women in that case had a completely different situation because Larry Nasser had inherent plausible deniability to get these girls naked and even had a specific procedure to put his hand in their vagina because he was massaging their hip. It was a legitimate medical procedure. Jerry Sandusky didn't have anything like that. So the so the, the, the Nasser case, which as Malcolm Gladwell uses on my recommendation to show the absurdity of the Sandusky case is is very telling, especially when you look at the temperament of Aaron Fisher. And again, I go to YouTube and watch that entire Aaron Fisher interview. And if you're interested, read his book. His book is nonsensical. It is absurd at times. It is laughable at other times. His his therapist is a quack, a wackadoodle who believes that the Philadelphia Eagles were in on this conspiracy because the Eagles asked Aaron Fisher if he wanted to go to a football game. It had nothing to do with anything. Uh, he believes that Jerry Sadusky uh, tried to sabotage Aaron Fisher's car to get him in a car accident when it was... Aaron Fisher was a horrendous driver. He's been in multiple accidents since then. He really uh, banged up one of his buddies, too, in a car. He, he almost yeah. killed two of his friends. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so this is, and I've, and for this podcast, I've interviewed Aaron Fisher's soon to be ex wife, Mallory, who, by the way, at one point in the story, hated my guts. Aaron Fisher was not abused by Jerry Sandusky. I believe he probably was abused sexually by his stepdad, Eric Daniels who, by the way, pled guilty to a 100 counts of child molestation and child pornography after Jerry Sandusky was already convicted. And Mallory, his his wife, is positive because she's heard Aaron talk about it and Aaron's mom talk about it, how Eric Daniels abused Aaron and abused everybody else in that family before Jerry ever came into their lives she never heard anything from aaron or her his mother about jerry abusing them and none of their actions are remotely consistent with jerry having abused anybody nor is his testimony even remotely credible at trial he gives four different timelines for when this happened this is not him being woken up in the middle of the night when did this happen this is after Three years of thinking about it with intensive uh, prosecutorial help and, and questioning and research. And at trial, he even says it happened. One of his timelines is well after he comes forward to the high school to complain about Jerry making him feel uncomfortable. And, and he becomes supposedly a victim. How does that make any sense? Oh, this so, is, yeah, I mean, so, sorry, John. But this is the danger with getting into like breaking uh, down his reaction just because uh, you're, you're whoa, saying. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's, well, it's a piece of the puzzle. I'm not saying uh, it's everything. But where is the. I'm sorry. If, when your word is all you have. When yeah. your word is all, when you have no corroborating evidence, when you have no contemporary, contemporaneous statement, when your friends have, many of your friends and neighbors have done interviews with me saying, this is bullshit. There's no way Aaron Fisher was abused by Jerry Sandusky. There, when, so when all you have is your word, your demeanor matters. And you, you ought to be, there ought to, and it doesn't prove, not crying doesn't prove that you weren't abused, but. You, I, I need something. I need some anger. I need some emotion. I need you looking at your interviewer. I need you not calling him a teddy bear. I need I need you to to say something other than uh, you know these platitudes where where there's and, and Chris Cuomo might as well have I mean oh my God he he basically placed rose petals down in Aaron Fisher's path he might as well have been the PR agent for his but, book. Look, you said Chatton, you said that you think he, which you don't know, but you said you think he in fact was abused by his stepfather. I, so, wait a minute, I, so I, I think I think his wife is a pretty good source on that. I I, oh, I I think the fact I, that Eric Daniels I, pled guilty I, into, to to the the actual I, charges is I'm pretty is pretty good that. evidence. I'm not, John, oh, John, I'm not dispute. Let me finish. 
I'm saying if that is true and that that's the assumption you're making, wouldn't in an interview about this traumatic topic, this traumatic thing that actually did happen to him, you're saying look at his affect, look at his, his face, look at how he's reacting. He clearly wasn't abused. I, I look, I'm not an expert. Well, on well, that well you're making it but, sound as if that's the only reason. I if if he if that was his interview and there was actual evidence to, that this happened, no, I would go okay. That's just weird. But because there's no evidence, his his. Uh, his smiling and not looking at Chris. How how is this funny? I mean, <laughs> th- 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 this is the guy that put Jerry Sandusky in prison. This is the guy that destroyed the entire Penn State program, all because his mother wanted fancy sports cars, which she got, and he wanted fancy sports cars, which he got. I'm telling you, this whole story is the greatest transfer of wealth from a state university to sports car dealerships in central Pennsylvania and plaintiff lawyers you could possibly imagine because that's where the money all went plaintiff lawyers and sports car dealerships in central pennsylvania that that and, that, and, a, and a few fancy houses so real estate probably got helped too in central pennsylvania among white trash so <laughs> sorry so your your biggest point i think that you made thus far with aaron fisher is and i'm not saying this isn't a, a big one is lack of evidence contemporaneous accounts Nothing. Uh, so no, hold on. Just calm down, John. Okay, let's get. Let me get there. And the other big thing is he went to the school and not to the police. Is there anything else? <laughs> you're, about- you're you're cherry picking. I've given you a uh, hundred <laughs> data points. Okay. I, I, so so wait, I, wait up. Why why don't you believe him? Is well, it why just, do is- you believe him? I, well, they see you, you flip. You have you. you have flipped. You have flipped on its head the entire entire judicial system. Why do you believe him? There, I, and I ask anyone who has who who is certain of Jerry Zanetsky's guilt, and we, and we never get an answer. My, I mean, my followers on Twitter ask the same question all the time. Tell me which accuser you believe the most and why. There is no reason to believe Aaron Fisher, and Aaron Fisher ended up getting paid, I I think, over eight million dollars for plus whatever he got for his book because of his testimony. In this case, he got everything he ever wanted. He wanted. Fancy sports cars and a and a big house, and his mom got a house with fancy cars and a place for her dogs to roam. What was and, the and, spark? Wait, this doesn't fall out of the sky. I mean, it doesn't mean that anybody's guilty or, or of anything. This doesn't fall out of nowhere. How how did we get here? With we'll start with victim number one because that's where we're at right now. How did we get here? Because and you could say that about anybody. Anybody I could accuse any rich guy or someone a part of a rich institution of molesting me when I'm 15 and I can go get their half of their bank account. It's like, what is it about him specifically? Is it just, there's no evidence. And that's a good argument. <laughs> there, I, I, well, I actually go way beyond. There's no evidence. I'm when, trying by to the way, lead you. By I the listen way, to your by show. Way, I know there's more there. I'm trying okay, to get it out by, of you. By the way, by the way, um, th- this, one of the great misconceptions of this case is that somehow we shouldn't be expecting there to be evidence. There's all sorts of evidence that we should be expecting. All these cases with a pedophile have pornography, every single one of them. No pornography in this case. All these cases have some level of payoffs, alcohol use, drug use. Interestingly, Aaron Fisher's uncle, DJ, his mom's brother, was involved in a case called the Dr. Barry Bender case just a few years before the Sandusky case broke, where he was, in my very strong opinion, he was a sex abuse victim of Dr. Barry Bender. He got paid by Dr. Barry Bender to perform sex acts as a teenage boy. His sister was pissed off. He never got big bucks in any sort of settlement in that situation. And she has told friends that she viewed Aaron as a way of getting the money that DJ never got. Interestingly, you know who the, and sure you don't, the detective on the Dr. Barry Bender case, who was a narcotics guy, not even a sex abuse guy. It was a guy by the name of Anthony Sassano. Anthony Sassano gets brought into the Sandusky case, I'm almost sure, by Aaron Fisher's mom. It's right in Aaron Fisher's book where it's very clear that she brings in her old buddy Anthony Sassano from the Dr. Barry Bender case. So there's all sorts of evidence that should be there that's not there. I would include in that DNA because what Aaron Fisher says at at trial is, and it's always difficult to parse what Aaron Fisher is really saying because he's, He's, a, he's not a very good talker, but, and his testimony is all over the place. But he implies 
at trial, his story expands so much that he was abused by Jerry Sandusky over a hundred times, over a hundred acts of, of oral sex, apparently in both directions, although oftentimes he mistakes which direction the oral sex was going, which is awfully weird for a heterosexual uh, boy to be mistaking this. And it's really weird for a heterosexual boy to go back a hundred times to see your, your male uh, abuser. But you know what happens in oral sex is uh, there's a mess that gets made. And, and your mom finds things in the laundry. And there's been, there was never a shred of evidence anywhere in this case of anything like that. They're not a shred. So, so the, you, you dismiss this idea. Well, there's just no evidence. That's your big thing. The, well, what else is there? Because, because there's, there needs to be evidence from a legal standpoint. But two, there's, this is ne- there's never been a case like this more investigated than this one. Yet they can't find squat. They can't find anything. Technically, uh, he was proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, though. This is no, but he tra- was not. He, but the, if you understand the trial, that it was, it was a joke. So it was a Salem witch trial. Here's what I was trying to get at, John. I was trying to because you you'll explain it better than I can. But I, I'll jump in because it, we're not we're not getting to where I want to go with this. Okay, there tell are, me where you want to go. There, well, just on this specific point, there are things surrounding Aaron Fisher that I have discovered from your work, from your podcast. Well, so I give know, me an example. That you, okay, where, how about where you the fact me? that his mom was talking about money within five seconds of this thing? Okay, coming. well, we, you're talking about an interview we have with his neighbor, which I've referenced. Yeah. We, his neighbor, Josh Fravel. Josh Fravel, you can go f- look for it on YouTube. To me, Josh Fravel is a tremendous witness. I interviewed him on the spot, the literally the spot where he witnesses Aaron Fisher telling his mom for the first time that Jerry Sandusky makes him feel uncomfortable. His immediate reaction is, this is bullshit. This, is, this kid's trying to pull something. And uh, long story short, you can view it for yourself, but you've already alluded to it. They go inside where she I, you know, seemingly asks him what the hell he's talking about. She comes out smoking a cigarette. This is welfare housing in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, the armpit of the universe. And, uh, and, and she says, I'm going to own that motherfucker's house. That's the first reaction. Not, not I'm going to go to the fucking police. I can't believe that Jerry Sandusky has been sexually abusing my kid. No, I'm going to own that motherfucker's house. And it is my opinion, because I know the background of the Dr. Barry Bender case, that she's immediately seeing this time we're going to get it right. This time we're going to make bank on this. And, and they go to the school because that's where, the, in her mind, the money's going to be. They don't go to the police. They're going to the school, the high school, thinking that they're going to get, and this is my uh, you know, assessment of the situation, I think it's a rational one, that, that, that that's, that's a place with deep pockets that might say, can you go away, keep this quiet, here's some money. The school, and they've been very criticized, including by Chris Cuomo in that piece. If you watch the 2020 thing on on YouTube, the school tells uh, Aaron Fisher, you might want to think about this. Now, that's been portrayed as everyone protecting Jerry Sandusky. What I would suggest is there's a completely different narrative. They know Aaron Fisher. They know Aaron Fisher is a storyteller. They know he's not credible. They know Jerry Sandusky. And, and they don't believe him. And part of the reason they don't believe him is this is not the first time this has happened with Aaron Fisher. There's a New York Times article about Aaron Fisher. It doesn't use his name, but it effectively outs him immediately after the story breaks with all sorts of details about him that references in like the second or third paragraph is track coach, a guy by the name of Tommy Hunter. And I remember, again, I'm thinking Jerry is guilty as hell this time, but I remember an alarm bell immediately going off in my head. Because they, they casually reference that Tommy Hunter left the school because of his relationship with Aaron Fisher. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait you just buried the fucking lead here. Wait, wait, wait a minute. We, 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 this guy already got rid of another coach? And, and the other thing was in relate, relationship to this, Justin, the narrative about Aaron Fisher, which is alluded to by Chris Cuomo in that piece you played, is that Aaron Fisher got so bullied 
at Central Mountain High School that he had to leave and transfer to another school because of all those horrible Penn State fans that just couldn't take that Joe Paterno uh, was a horrible guy and that Jerry Sandusky was a pedophile. And I remember thinking, wait a fucking minute. Well, wait, wait a minute. These are 15, 16-year-old kids. I, having been a high school coach, I've coached different sports, football, golf. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I mean, I, I know teenage kids, all right? These kids are not Joe Paterno worshipers, all right? They don't give a shit. They, they, they've never gone to Penn State. Maybe their parents care about Penn State. Their grandparents probably really care about Penn State, but they don't. The more likely scenario in this incredibly anti-bullying culture that we now have in our public school system, that if he's getting bullied, it's because they don't fucking believe him. That, that's the reason why he's getting bullied, if you use your goddamn brain. And, but, the, you know, the news media doesn't use their brain anymore. They, 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 like, they get a narrative they like, and that nothing else matters. So I spoke to Tommy Hunter. I, I, spoke, I actually went and spoke to that guy I, for, for an extended period of time. He has zero evidence or any belief that Jerry Sadusky ever abused Aaron Fisher, and he believes he got railroaded because Aaron Fisher was telling st- or the, the school, I don't want to mis, mischaracterize this, the school was misunderstanding the relationship between him and Aaron. And that that they thought they were getting too close and that there were emails between the two of them that were misconstrued. And basically, uh, Aaron was very upset by this. There's Facebook postings by Aaron about how upset he was right around the time the Sandusky story was hitting about how upset he was that Tommy Hunter had been let go uh, by the school because that was his track coach. So there's a lot of different pieces here that the media completely ignored. Josh Fravel, the New York Times had Josh Fravel. They, they spoke to Josh Fravel. Josh Fravel is barely mentioned in that article, and nothing about being uh, uh, very skeptical of Aaron Fisher's story is in there. Tommy Hunter's story is in that New York, original New York Times article, which set the narrative about Aaron, and uh, none of the real context for Tommy Hunter's story is in there. The reality is that the, the narrative about Aaron Fisher, in my opinion, is completely upside down. He's actually the bad guy, mostly because of his mother here. His mother is a piece of work. I mean, she she is a a classic welfare queen. She's been she was living off welfare, scamming the system for years, looking for her big payday. And this was it. And after their book comes out, we have we have interviews with the two women that were profiled in the local paper who were helping her promote the book with a rally on Aaron Fisher's behalf. They thought they were helping this poor sex abuse victim. Heather and Judy are their names. I have interviews with both of them. They now, based upon their interaction with Dawn, Aaron's mom, believe that Aaron was not abused by Jerry Sandusky and that they got... They got snowed. The whole thing was a con. You've done so many interviews just on this component of the case alone, just victim number one. I'm curious, have you had anybody that you've spoken to at the school, that Aaron's friend, anybody in his atmosphere that actually does believe him, that said, you know, John, that this was a bad case? I mean, was there anybody pushing back? Because so far we're, what, nine for nine on everyone you've talked to? Doesn't well, let's review who I've talked to close to Aaron Fisher. Yeah. Um, I've spoken uh, on the record with his wife, soon to be ex-wife. I have spoken to his direct neighbor. I've spoken to uh, a secondary neighbor. I've spoken to uh, at least four or five very close friends of his. Uh, 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 um, I have spoken uh, to the two women who uh, who promoted and hosted his rally. Um, I mean, so we're, we're over 10 now. It's actually, I believe the number isn't like 14 or 15 people that are in his direct sphere. I have never had anybody, anybody tell me, come to me and say, John, you got this wrong about Aaron Fisher. And, and, and that's impossible. That is impossible in this atmosphere, the unique atmosphere of this case, where you, you've correctly stated everybody knows Jerry's guilty. He has no political backing whatsoever. Everyone hates his guts. I should be getting bombarded because I'm very well known in the story. I'm very well known in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. I should be getting bombarded by people saying, John, you got this wrong. Stop it. Instead, especially regarding Aaron Fisher, I have... I still occasionally get contacted by people close to him saying, wait a minute, 
Wait, and, and the reason why I got more about Aaron Fisher than many of the other accusers is he's the only one whose name is truly public. He's the only one that did a TV interview of the criminal uh, accusers. He's the only one that wrote a book. So, so therefore, he's well known within his community. Every time I have quote unquote outed, although I'm not doing anything remotely illegal because it's member, it's public record, but the media never reported their names. But every time. I have put an, another name out there of a key accuser. Invariably, I will have people fairly close to them, sometimes very close to them, sometimes relatives of them come forward to me and say, no, this didn't happen. So we're expanding it even beyond victim number one. So in the entire process, you've, you've done a, a incredibly thorough, fascinating oh podcast that is ongoing. Right. With the benefit of hindsight. Yes, yes, with the benefit of hindsight, and it's it's voluminous. It's incredible. 19 it's, episodes. It, it's um, With a co-host, uh, Liz Habib, who is the uh, television TV uh, host uh, of, the, of the Fox affiliate sports anchor in Los Angeles. You're a lot and, nicer to her than me. Well, you know. You're more patient with her than uh, me. You're, uh, you're a little hard on me. Uh, am I really? No, nah, I'm kidding. Okay. No, you're right. good. You're good. I she, like when people she, yell. Liz and, I battle, Liz and I battle pretty good in this podcast. No, you do. You have some moments. <laughs> yeah, you have some moments. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just I want to say, John, that the point, and correct me if I'm wrong, you've gone into a, a lot of different circles, victim number one circle, victim number two circles. You've been in a lot of these sort of realms. Right. You haven't had one person in this atmosphere or in any of these individual segments of atmosphere say to you, you blew this, you got this wrong. That is a, I'm so glad you asked that question. And by the way, I'm glad that you're, you're, you know, asking me difficult questions or what you think might be difficult questions. Cause I have answers to all of them. And to me, the fact that I have only been approached by what I would consider to be one person involved in this case, one and as opposed to you go back to your oxen's racer, I've, I've, I've been approached by many, many dozens of people close to the accusers saying no fucking way. I've had one person close to an accuser come to me and say, John, you got this wrong. It was the mother of one of the settlement accusers who happened to be a neighbor of Aaron Fisher's. There's what we call the Lock Haven Five. I truly believe that uh, the, the, the other four accusers in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, uh, should be paying me a lot of money because uh, I, I believe that once I convinced the people of Lock Haven that Aaron Fisher was full of shit, that these other four guys went, oh, my God, this is easy money. Let's go. And, and they, 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 uh, several of them made their uh, accusations years later. Anyway, to finish this story, because it's an important story, this mother contacted me. Skylar Coover is, is the name of the accuser. He's a settlement accuser, not a criminal trial accuser. And, uh, and she, uh, she said, John, I think you got this wrong. I said, can I please talk to you? She said, sure. We set up a time to talk. I probably spoke to her two and a half, three hours, one night on the phone. By the time the conversation was over, because this was a woman who loved Jerry Sandusky, loved him. And then became convinced because her son became an accuser that he must be a pedophile. I believed with everything in my being that I had convinced her that she had misunderstood her son or that her son was not telling the truth. We set up a second time to talk to where I, because I wanted her to talk to her son and get back to me, give, give me the rebuttal. And we set up a specific time to have a conversation. I called at that time. And there was no answer. And I never got a return call. And I never heard from her again. Now, people can make up their own minds. But I interpreted that as uh, she decided that Skylar is very rich right now. And that this is a development that was good for her family. And that there was no need to rock the boat. That's what happened here. So even the she was the exception that proved the rule to me that if if this if if I was wrong I would be constantly getting bombarded with people saying no 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 Ziggler you're, you're you you got this totally wrong you're an asshole let me tell you why you're wrong instead I get exactly the opposite which in this political environment is using Oxum's razor is not possible. It's not possible. It is the total inverse of the public. It's like the, the farther away 
you get from knowledge of the case and knowledge of the story, it's like you get more and more universally in this you know, direction versus the people, other. People who are directly involved in this story, we had an interview with uh, Kevin Horn, who was the editor of Onward State when this story happened. Onward State is one of the two uh, Penn State student publications. He ch- covered every bit of this case, was at the trial, pretended like Jerry was guilty the whole bit. He did an interview with me, finally coming out saying, yeah, uh, by the way, Jerry's, I agree with you, he's innocent. And that within people close to the case in State College, this is like a dirty little secret that everybody close to the case now believes, but is afraid in most cases to talk about publicly because there's nothing in it for them. There's no, there's no risk reward benefit. And that's what, and it's a miracle. I've been able to get the nine or 10 people on the record in the podcast to do this. It's a miracle, but there's many more. It's it's like this dirty little secret. Well, I, I you know I talked about it a little bit before the show. I had multiple people contact me when they saw our promo for the show. You know, at least loosely familiar with your work, had heard your name or had seen some of your content. I I had a, one of my coworkers say she wanted to come sit in studio and yell at you. Um, she <laughs> was a, a victim of you know abuse as a child. Um, you know and. Has a lot to say about it. And I had people saying that uh, whatever I'm thinking of, of making this show into, this is going to be an impediment to that. I had two different people tell me, one in the media uh, out West, uh, not to do it, to spite this. Okay, and, 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 what, and what you're just articulating, I think you know this, is exactly why this story was able to go down the path that it did, because I guarantee that none of the people that you just talked to have any clue about the facts of the case. And part of the reason why the, the, other, the truth of this case cannot get any traction is because the popular opinion is so much on the other side. And I guarantee I've, I've had this happen. We have pitched this story at the highest levels. I mean, I live in the Los Angeles area. We have pitched this Everywhere. And everyone finds this story to be incredibly compelling, the evidence to be compelling, the Malcolm Gladwell book to provide us with the cover to do this. But in any organization, you're going to have someone that was sexually abused and they will always go to the mat to veto it. Not because they have any knowledge of this case, but because they somehow think this is maybe the most bizarre element of this last 10 year nightmare for me on this story is that somehow by saying something didn't happen, I'm defending the thing that supposedly happened. I mean, how do you, well, how do you wrap your brain around that, that? It's that's pretty easy to wrap your brain around, right? Because they think that it did happen. No, but, but I'm people, saying it didn't happen. So, so I'm not defending but they, they it. They think it did. So it's not but, that you're defending it. No, you're, you're squashing the no, proper uh, conviction of it, if not in trial. At, no, but, yeah. but in this situation, I'm I'm the bearer of good news. No one got sexually abused in the in the Penn State scandal. That should be news that uh, people should embrace. But because we're so invested in this, no one wants to admit that they were wrong. No one and, and Penn Staters are the worst at this. Penn Staters are the very worst because for uh, most Penn Staters, and I don't know what the percentage is, but you know, for for a majority of Penn Staters, they are in a position when 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 they are uh, exposed to my work, to having to, if I'm right, admit that they were wrong, that they panicked, that they threw their five best people under the bus, that they endured years of pain and ridicule for no reason, pain and ridicule that they have dealt with and is now in their rear view mirror. They don't want to revisit this. Penn St- I mean, Mike Agavino is our executive producer. He's the only reason why the podcast exists. Uh, he's the one that funded the thing. He, he, it's an amazing thing that he's done. But I, I'm always trying to tell him Penn Staters are not our audience for this because it's too heavy a lift for Penn Staters. They have to think too ill of themselves, too ill of their university. By the way, too ill of the paternal family, which which – played an important role in the railroading of Jerry Sandusky. It's, it's just not sellable because we're living in a world now where people have 15 seconds to decide what, what the truth is. And if it doesn't fit in a tweet, it doesn't matter. Well, we but, talked, we've talked at great length about Aaron Fisher and I, it, rightfully so well, victim number one, <laughs> this is the, the seed where this all grew from. But I do think 
uh, you can, you know, slap me if I'm wrong. But I think from <laughs> my experience with people talking about this case, the thing, and it was our same thing in our little sample size of Mike six. McQuarrie. Mike McQuarrie, boy in the shower. That's mm-hmm. what people remember. People don't know who Aaron Fisher is if they don't follow this case. They don't remember whatever, that right. there was a boy that accused uh, Jerry Sandusky of oral sex under times. The thing that has stuck. Right. The thing that not just got reported, but got repeated, mm-hmm. that got talked about at bar, was Jerry Sandusky anally raping a young boy in a shower. A assistant coach named Mike McQuarrie saw it and basically did nothing but tell Joe Paterno. Joe Paterno did nothing. That's what sticks. No one else knows what victim five said. Very few people even which, know about victim by the, one. Which, which, by the way, goes once again to how this happened because no one bothered to care about these other victims other than our accusers, other than, well, there's so many of them, they must be credible. Uh, yeah. And if you understand the timeline and the motivations and the details, that's not the case. But I just want to make sure we, we keep pointing that out, that everything's the opposite of, of the way it should be in this case. What, the reason that this was allowed to happen was that no one bothered to look at the actual allegations against Jerry Sandusky. But I agree with you, 100%. To, to most people's perceptions, it is the Mike McQuarrie episode that matters the most. And obviously, that's the one that matters the most with regard to Penn State. And that's the easiest one to debunk. What actually happened? <laughs> Did you know? I mean, uh, short of someone being in the room, I think you know as much as anybody can know about this incident without having been there. Okay, here's what happened uh, with regard to the episode in the shower, the infamous, in, 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 infamous Mike McQuarrie episode. Um, I believe that on. December 29th of 2000, not March 1st, 2002, not February 9th, 2001, which were the first two dates Mike McQuarrie testified to. Then on December 29th, 2000, Jerry Sandusky starts the day in Washington, Pennsylvania. If you know anything about Pennsylvania geography, that is at the far, far western point of the state. It's almost on the West Virginia, Ohio uh, line. Uh, That's where Jerry Sandusky grew up. He, by the way, grew up in a rec home where everyone was naked all the time. It was not a big deal in his, in his universe, in his era. That was just the way they did it. And, uh, he is there because he's doing a book signing for his book. That's coming out called ironically enough touched, which the prosecution hilariously, in my opinion, tried to pretend was like a confession. Well, if it was a confession, that was your whole theory of the case that he's trying to confess that he's a pedophile. Why do we still not have a confession 10 years later? Why is there no plea bargain? Why is he still appealing at every possible opportunity? Your theory just got blown to bits, but I digress. So he's in Washington, PA, and he's there because remember, December 29th, that's Christmas vacation, right? There's no school. So he's there with a kid by the name of Alan Myers. Alan Myers is 13 years old. He's getting close to his 14 year, uh, 14th birthday. Uh, he's a, uh, a promising football player. He's two and a half years away from winning a varsity letter on his high school football team uh, at that time. And he is exceedingly close to Jerry Sandusky. He has no father figure. He is, in, in my very strong opinion, the evidence indicates overwhelmingly, Jerry Sandusky is effectively his fire, father. He travels with Jerry to Washington for the book signing. When the book signing is done that afternoon, they drive back to State College because the following morning, uh, Jerry Sandusky has another book signing for the book Touch. That would be December 30th. On the way from Washington, PA to State College, Jerry Sandusky stops to get gas. I presume that that means he must have then called a friend of his. I'm not 100% sure who called whom, but since it was stopped for gas, I'm going to presume Jerry made the call. He made a call to his college roommate. Then you're thinking, why does this matter? It matters because his college roommate, I had a son that was going to the University of Virginia. At this very time period, Jerry is being, has been interviewed four times to be the head football coach at the University of Virginia. It's been reported in the papers that Jerry Sandusky has been offered the job. It's been assumed he's going to take the job. He actually did have a contract in his hand. In fact, the friend, the college roommate who I've interviewed, joked with Jerry that it was bizarre that the University of Virginia was going to make him their head football coach and pay him $400,000 plus when he couldn't even figure out how to pump his own gas properly, uh, which I totally believe knowing what I know about Jerry Sandusky. Uh, well, unbeknownst to Jerry, which we'll get to in a moment, things at the University of Virginia are quickly changing. 
not because of Jerry Sandusky. See, in retrospect, the the media has looked at the University of Virginia head coaching situation as, oh, Virginia must have gotten wind that Jerry Sandusky was a pedophile, <laughs> which is just it's just preposterous on its face, especially when you know all the connections between the University of Virginia and Penn State. In fact, Jay Paterno was a graduate assistant at the University of Virginia. He's married to a University of Virginia alum. Uh, George Welsh uh, had, you know, was a huge connection between University of Virginia and Penn State. So the idea that Jerry Sadusky would have four interviews to be their head football coaching job before, before Penn State finally dropped. By the way, he's a pedophile. You might want to stay away from him. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Uh, and so, um, but what was really happening at this time is, that the New York Jets had just lost their last three games of the 2000 season. You're thinking, what the hell does that have anything to do with it? Well, the head football coach at the University of uh, uh, at, at, at the New York Jets at that time was Al Groh. This was in the wake of the whole Bill Belichick, Bill Parcells controversy. Al Groh gets the New York Jets job. They lose their last three games of the year. They lose a playoff spot on la last Sunday. Al Groh goes from hero to goat. He knows he's about to get fired. He He's a University of Virginia alum. He calls up the University of Virginia at the last minute and says, hold everything. I want the job. And because they were a little concerned about Jerry Sandusky wanting to start a new charity uh, in Charlottesville and what that might entail and all the complications of that, and they got their, you know, a, a pro football coach who's an alum, they decide to give the job to Al Groh. Well, that night, the, that Friday night, December 29th, Alan Myers, who's in the car with Jerry Sandusky, they go to pe the state college, they go to the football locker room, they have a workout, they take a shower, and for whatever reason, Mike McQuarrie, I believe, after having watched the Peach Bowl between LSU and Georgia Tech, you can find it for yourself, happened to end at exactly the right time, around 8.37 p.m. Uh, on that Friday night. After watching the Peach Bowl, Penn State's not in a bowl game that year. They haven't played a game in a month at that point. Their season ended very early. Michael Query's bored. He goes over to the Lash building, allegedly to get some tapes or whatever, and he hears... Hears slapping sounds in the shower. Hears. That's that's his own testimony. Hears. What happened to eye contact? Well, uh, uh, the that eye came up somewhere. The eye contact uh, evolves, and eventually, Mike says that for two or three seconds, he sees a reflection through the mirror, presumably a steamy mirror in a in a shower. Uh, Jerry Sandusky uh, in close contact with what he proceed to be a 10-year-old boy. That was eventually Mike McQuarrie's testimony. In close contact, but no sexual... Well, if you, if, you list, if you look very carefully at his testimony, the jury, and the jury did look very carefully at his testimony, Mike McQuarrie does not say he saw an, a sex act, or certainly not an anal sex, which is what was written in the presentment. Uh, Franco Harris, I have an interview with Franco Harris, NFL legend, uh, Penn State legend. Franco Harris confronted Mike McCurry at Joe Paterno's funeral. Now, this must have been, if there's ever a movie about the real story here, this is going to be one of my favorite scenes because Franco is a, is, a, is a real legend. I mean, and, and he's got gravitas. And, and Mike McCurry, you know, is in the midst of this horrendous uh, shitstorm, and Joe Paterno has just died, and it's at Joe Paterno's funeral, and Franco comes up to Mike man-to-man, one-on-one, -on -one, and asks him, what the hell? happened? What did you see? And Franco, in great detail, and you can hear it in our interview, you can find it at framingpaterno.com, which is our, our website, and it's, it's in uh, the With the Benefit of Hindsight podcast. He, in great detail, explains how he became completely convinced that Mike McCreary did not witness any sort of sexual assault. And that what really, and this is me talking, what really transpired here is that in the 10-year period, from this time that Mike McCurry gets the date, the year, and the month totally wrong to the time investigators come to him in late 2010 desperate for a witness, that they are able to mold his perceptions. They're able to take an event that was weird, awkward, strange, inappropriate probably, uh, and turn that, it doesn't take very much, turn that into a, a sex act and then once they get him to say sex act, they take sex act and they put into the presentment anal rape. 
And when you put anal rape into the presentment, and that's how it gets reported, everyone's brains explode. Rightfully so. Explode. But at trial, he said he never saw an anal rape, and the jury did not convict Jerry Sandusky on that particular count, for whatever that's worth. And this was a hanging jury, if you know anything about this case. So what I believe happened is that Alan Myers and Jerry Sandusky were goofing around in the shower. Jerry is a goofball. He's got boundary issues. This was the way he was brought up. He's a kid. He, he's an adolescent in, in, in his state of development. I happen to believe, and this is not, I'm not an expert in this, but based upon his medical records and everything I've learned, including six hours of interviews with him in prison, I actually believe he's an asexual person. I don't believe that he is sexual at all, which is partially why he blew the Bob Costas question because he never even considered the concept that he sexually attracted to young boys. All, this, <laughs> all his kids are adopted, right? All his kids are adopted. Yep. Uh, he had many foster kids. Um, and, you know, I, I know for sure that Dottie, his wife, uh, has only ever been, quote unquote, with one man. Uh, that's interesting when we get to his medical records because his medical records, in my opinion, blow apart the whole case. But um, but just to finish the story, I believe that they were goofing around in the shower. Mike was probably weirded out by it enough to where he talked to his dad and his dad's friend, a Dr. Dranoff. When that happened, I don't know. I am skeptical that it happened immediately. But the most important part of my revelation, which is in Malcolm Gladwell's Talking to Strangers book, is that he did not go see Joe Paterno the next day. See, that's the key to December 29th being the day. And there's a whole series of reasons why we now know December 29th and not February 9th was the day. Uh, as it turns out, Jerry finds out the next morning that he did not get the University of Virginia job. I mean, this, this was a horrendous 24-hour period for Jerry Sandusky. Within 24 hours, Mike McCurry witnesses something that 10 years later would be perceived as anal rape, and the University of Virginia hires Al Groh to be the head coach instead of him. If, if, and, and you know what? The great football fans will really appreciate this. This is a Paul Harvey. Now you know the rest of the story. If people remember who Paul Harvey is, or maybe this is a Vin Scully type story. You know, Jerry Sandusky became famous because his defense intercepted Vinny Testaverde five times in the 1986 Fiesta Bowl National Championship game, right? So Vinny Testaverde's worst moment in college, he was the Heisman Trophy winner at that time, was because of Jerry Sandusky's defense. Well, you know who the quarterback was for the New York Jets that lost those last three games that cost Jerry Sandusky the University of Virginia head coaching job? Vinny Testaverde. So the whole thing was Vinny's revenge. Uh, and and so, so Vinny gets his, his revenge. Uh, I'm sure he has no idea this happened. But by, by losing the last three games of that season, Al Groh gets the Virginia job. If, if Jerry Sandusky gets the Virginia job, none of this happens. None of it. None, not a shred of this happens. Uh, it never get, it gets off the, it gets out of the batter's box. Uh, and, and Jerry's gone from State College. And there is no Aaron Fisher. And, and there is no Mike McQuarrie episode. And so um, I, have, I have likened the Mike McQuarrie episode to a Loch Ness monster sighting. Uh, I believe that in December, 20, on December 29th of 2000, Mike McQuarrie experiences... <laughs> Well, on his visit to the lock, uh, uh, some ripples in the water and maybe a head poking out of the water that seemed very strange to him and peculiar enough where he told some people about it. Uh, by the way, told Dr. Dranoff three times it was not sexual. That's important. That was Dr. Dranoff's testimony. Um, and then 10 years later, investigators come to him and go, did you know, Mike, that there's a monster in that lock? We were told that you saw something in that lock 10 years ago. Uh, there's a monster there. In fact, this monster has been abusing this kid by the name of Aaron Fisher, and we are desperate to try to find a way to capture this monster. Can you help us? Now, all of a sudden, Mike reevaluates what that weird thing that he saw 10 years ago and goes, oh my God, it must have been the monster in the lock. Well, guess what? There is no Loch Ness monster, and there is no monster at Penn State named Jerry Sandusky, who was a sexual abuser. This was a classic situation of, of someone's perception and memory 
being manipulated 10 years later by people with a massive incentive to do so. And by the way, the reason why we know this is the case is that we have the story of the boy that was in the shower, Alan Myers, victim number two. Let's get to Alan Myers in one second. We've referenced a couple times tonight the Bob Costas exchange with Sandusky. We did pull that. I want to play it, and then I want to get back to Alan Myers. But just this gives sort of the context. If I think you look at it differently. You look at it as Jerry Sandusky. This is evidence of him being innocent. You think this is a point, you know, sort of to your case. It was generally perceived as this guy's clearly guilty. He can't even answer right. whether or not he's sexually right. attracted to kids. So let's play the clip. Many have seen it. Let's revisit it. And I want to get back to Alan Myers in this whole situation. Are you a pedophile? No. Are you sexually attracted to young boys, to underage boys? Am I sexually attracted to yes. underage boys? Sexually attracted? You know, no, I, I enjoy young people. I... I love to be around them. Um, I, I, but no, I'm not sexually attracted to young boys. So not an emphatic denial there. And that's what the hang up was. I remember seeing that in real time, you know, a decade ago and thinking this guy's guilty as fuck. Of course. And I, when I saw that, I knew that that would be the reaction at that time. I um, was of the belief that Jerry Sandusky must be guilty. That interview was one of the first moments that I started to think, wait a minute. Um, and, for the, and for very substantive reasons. First of all, you say it's not a declarative answer. I'm glad you played the first part of that clip, which no one ever plays. Are you a pedophile? No. That's fair. Okay. I, so um, the, the confusion comes in with this sexual attraction thing, which goes to my theory that Jerry is actually asexual. But this is also the way Jerry talks. Ask anybody who knows him. This is the way he talks. He will, he will repeat the question all the time. He doesn't like giving an inexact answer. But there's another thing that happened in that segment with Bob Costas that no one ever remembers because of the strategic blunder of epic proportions of having Jerry Sandusky do an interview with Bob Costas. And by the way, I've spoken with Bob a couple different times within the last week about this very situation in great detail. And this may be public fairly soon. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the reality is that if there had not been a Jerry Sandusky, if Joe Amendola, who you saw there for a second, Jerry Sandusky's defense attorney, had not been stupid enough and had not been so uh, desirous of ingratiating himself to Bob Costas, uh, and offered up his client on a telephone interview for which he was completely unprepared. The story of that interview, Justin, would have been Joe Amendola revealing, we have the boy in the McQuarrie episode, and he says nothing happened. And that's where that, we want to get to right now. So Alan Myers, I want you to tell the story, but I'll set it up. Alan Myers, victim number two, the child in the Mike McQuarrie episode in the shower goes into Joe Amendola, attorney for Jerry Sandusky's office, unsolicited, right? Jump in if mm -hmm. I'm wrong. Right. Doesn't, doesn't, isn't solicited at all. Walks in of his own accord. Joe Amendola's not even prepared. Gives a, unannounced, no appointment, gives a bulletproof statement saying that he was the boy in the shower, number one. He was the boy in question. And that Jerry Sandusky had never abused him. Not that night. Not ever. And that Mike McQuarrie is not telling the truth. So this is, it's important to remember. This, and he's this, doing this, this as a 24-year-old sergeant, in, or former sergeant in the Marine Corps, who is married. So what would the motivation be for an actual victim in this situation? If we're, if we're believing the story that he was, quote, anally raped in the shower, mm -hmm. what would the motivation be for this adult? I, I get lines, if you're cornered, you're asked, you know, maybe you have shame. That shame is a huge component of a lot of people that falsely deny things that have happened to them. But I, I, this has been one of the hardest parts for me to wrap my head around from the con side. This is where I align with you strongly. What is the motivation for Alan Myers to walk into that office unsolicited, unannounced, and give that statement? And with his mother there, by the with way. With his mother there. And, and vehemently, def I can't, not a child sex victim expert. But I, I, I can't wrap my head around the motivation to falsely deny this, to come forward and give a statement so strong. I, I, 
correct me if I'm wrong. They, they didn't record that, right? He has no record. There's a written record. I don't. I am. I, believe me. I wish there, there was a recording, but there was no. There was no preparation for this. They, they in fact, Alan Myers had to wait around for Amendola to get his FBI trained uh, former police officer investigator to come into the office. So, um, but do you, you've made a very important point. Because the sex crimes experts have set up the rules for evaluating these situations where it is impossible for, uh, for, to disprove any allegation. Because what they will say, I guarantee it, I've heard it, is that, no, no, this is, this is uh, common behavior among a, because everything's common behavior. There's, there's no, there is no uh, behavior that a sex crimes, quote unquote, expert cannot rationalize. They, I've always, I've asked a thousand times, can you tell me what behavior would be inconsistent with abuse? Just tell me what it would be. Because I guarantee you, if that exists, Alan Myers did it. Because it's not just that. See, if it was just that, if it was any one thing, Justin, I wouldn't feel that passionately about Alan Myers. It is a mountain of not just words, but actions. Actions that are unambiguous. They're over an extended period of time. They're, as, they're into, well into an adulthood. I cannot emphasize enough. As a sergeant in the Marine Corps who is married. He now has children. This is a heterosexual who was a sergeant in the Marine Corps. This is not this is not somebody consistent with someone who's frightened of his accuser or is trying to hide the fact that he was actually abused. Uh, to your point, why would he bother to come forward? This is a guy who lived with the Sandusky's while he went to Penn State. This is a guy who traveled well over 10 hours when it, from his Marine barracks to go to the funeral of Jerry Sandusky's mother. By the way, we know this not from the Sandusky's. We know this and other things from letters to the editor that Alan Myers had written in his own name in local papers before the story went national. His name was, a, was public with regard to Jerry Sandusky's defense before November of 2011 because the grand jury investigation had been released by Sarah Gannam, the so-called Pulitzer Prize winner, who's a fraud, who uh, in March of 2011 uh, let it out as basically an ad for new victims for the prosecution. She was an arm of the prosecution. And so at that point, there were supporters of Jerry Sandusky who started a letter writing campaign. One of them was Alan Myers. It was, it appeared in two different local newspapers. I have the clippings and it was sent to the attorney general's office. So, <laughs> And, and this is a guy who, uh, when, he, when he, he had his senior high school football game, Jerry Sandusky stood in him as his father. This was a guy who coached flag football with, with young boys with Jerry Sandusky. I mean, so if he was a victim of Jerry Sandusky from a sexual abuse standpoint, he's now helping to foster further abuse, theoretically. Did although- Alan Myers, sorry to cut you off, John, but did Alan Myers accuse Jerry Sandusky of multiple incidences of sexual abuse, or was it just the, I mean, I know he changed his story, but did we land on, oh, Sandusky abused me a hundred times like Aaron Fisher, or was it just that incident? Well, you're, you're getting probably a little too far ahead of the story for, for people who aren't familiar with it. Okay, go So, ahead. I mean, but, so he, he does not become a quote-unquote victim of Jerry Sandusky until after the trial. And, then it, and it's only then to collect his $7.9 million. And there's never been a document of his actual testimony that's reliably his saying that I'm a victim and here's what happened. He testified in 2016 at a Jerry Sandusky uh, um, appeal hearing, uh, where, which I attended. <laughs> I flew all the way from Los Angeles to, to uh, Center County, and uh, it was ridiculous. I mean, his testimony was ridiculous. I mean, 34 times he says he couldn't remember. He couldn't remember where the picture of him and Jerry, him in his Marine uniform, and Jerry arm in arm was taken when it was taken at his wedding. I, I, mean, I, I mean, because he didn't want to admit that he invited Jerry Sandusky and Dottie Sandusky to his wedding. Uh, and the judge couldn't understand the relevance of that. And I'm, at that point, I'm like, okay, this is over. I mean, if it's not relevant that you 
uh, invited Jerry Sandusky to your wedding and had a picture taken with him arm in arm. And oh, by the way, Jerry Sandusky used that photo. That was the photo Jerry Sandusky used in his retirement letter from the Second Mile Charity well after he knew there was an investigation of him involving child sex abuse. So if Alan Myers was abused, Alan Myers would have been the first person that authorities would go to. In fact, they did go to him. They interviewed him in September of 2011. And he ends the interview. This is on record. He ends the interview by saying, I think you're trying to get me to lie about Jerry Sandusky. I will never say anything bad about Jerry Sandusky. This interview is over. Now, that's not a sex abuse victim. That's, that's somebody who's like, what are you guys doing to my friend? So the people that say, because uh, myriad people said that I, I'm going to lose whatever traction I have with this show. I shouldn't have you on. I, I, I hear them saying right now on their couch that it's a Stockholm Syndrome uh, Well, situation. that's not a real thing. That's not a real thing, by the way. But that's but that's where people go okay, in I'm terms sure. of the he's standing in for him as his father at his graduation and that it, it's I'm sympathizing. He's a with sergeant my, in the Marine Corps. I, that's where people go. <laughs> Have you never you've heard that? I've certainly heard that's it. Where but people it makes, go. I understand. You don't buy it. I, I, well, it's, well, first of all, I don't even agree that there is such a thing as Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> but even if there is, there's no. This is not consistent with that. This, what, I, I would just simply ask people, what would be evidence that you were not abused by Jerry Sandusky? What, 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 because the, I've left data points out of this whole situation. You can check out episode number eight of With the Benefit of Hindsight. It's, it's I think, our best episode. It, 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 the, it, when you understand the full narrative of Alan Myers, there is no chance he was abused by Jerry Sandusky. Now, it is possible. It is possible that he becomes convinced by his lawyers in the media that Jerry Sandusky is a pedophile and that he just dodged the bullet and was never personally sexually abused and that therefore he can rationalize why it's okay not to testify at Jerry Sandusky's trial and that he can be there to get his $7.9 million because he's no longer in the Marine Corps. He's had at least one DUI. He's married. He needs money. And who couldn't use $7.9 million? We've talked a couple times. You know, you've mentioned the thirst that the prosecution had in this process, looking for over the course of two years, please get us, you know, somebody. Mike McQuarrie, help us on this. Hey, Alan Myers, we really need a second witness. I'm curious where you land, and I know it's all speculation because we're not inside their heads and you weren't in the room, but where do you land on the prosecution's motivation in this? I, I don't know enough prosecutors, but the ones that I do know, I would say, aren't thirsty to conjure up a case to bury or wrongfully convict someone with insufficient evidence or certainly if they know or suspect that they're innocent. I, I, I'm curious where you kind of land on, you've mm-hmm. talked about it, they're hunting, they're thirsty for these witnesses, mm-hmm. they want this mm-hmm. case. Do you think that there's a nefarious intent? I, I don't get why. Jerry Sandusky is so unlucky to have this thirsty prosecution because in my experience, I mean, I went to law school, uh, got the law degree, have a lot of attorney friends. Mm. They don't, they want to leave a lot of cases alone if, if they don't think they're going to win mm-hmm. and, and prevail a trial. They're, they're, they tend to be, if anything, averse to mm-hmm. cases lacking sufficient evidence because they don't want to get clobbered and drag out and it's, it's bad on them. So where do you land on this? We're saying there's no evidence, and there, I'll admit, I mean, there's very little evidence in this case for a there's, guy that, there's was, none. that was convicted. So I, like, what was their motive? Where do you it's sort a very of good, Very good question. Uh, and consistent with my comments at the beginning of this interview, I am not a conspiracy person. I am a lifelong Republican conservative who's always been pro-prosecution until this case uh, ch- changed my view of what prosecution is uh, capable of. Uh, I do not uh, tend to believe that this was a, we're out to get a man we think is innocent. I believe that one of the most dangerous uh, elements of humanity is when people convince themselves that they are doing the work of the just. And then they believe that the ends justify the means and they are willing and able to cut corners 
and to do things that might even be very unethical and even illegal in order to get the monster. This is going back kind of to the Loch Ness Monster theory. If you think you got a monster in the lock and the monster is abusing young boys, you're going to do everything you possibly can to stop it. So once you become invested in the idea that Jerry Sandusky is guilty, and let's be clear, the Catholic Church situation in Pennsylvania is huge. So Aaron Fisher comes forward in late 2008. Look at the timeline. This is, that is exactly after the time period where the Catholic Church scandal in Pennsylvania is massive. So they're all seeing this. The prosecution is seeing, investigators are seeing this through the prism of, well, this is the way it works. Uh, that, you know, it's just like the Catholic Church. And by the way, uh, the Catholic Church situation made some careers. And this case had all the makings of something that was going to make some careers. And I already mentioned the name Anthony Sassano. Anthony Sassano, who I don't believe was qualified as a narcotics agent, uh, and I don't believe he's a very bright guy, uh, he, he wrote a memo uh, where he says, basically, I'm paraphrasing, but he, uh, this is a fair paraphrase, that you know our case might not be very strong now. But don't worry, once we arrest Jerry Sandusky, and you know he loses the presumption of innocence, and it's now safe for everyone to come forward. They they so convinced themselves that the only reason why they they couldn't find more credible accusers was that people were afraid, and that they had to destroy the the conspiracy of silence and the fear of Sandusky and of Penn State. And that once that happened, we were going to find manna from heaven and get all sorts of really good accusers. That did not happen. Now, in numbers it did because every trial, every plaintiff's attorney in the state of Pennsylvania and beyond knew that there was going to be a blank check written by the Penn State Board of Trustees after Joe Paterno and Grand Spanier are fired, but not in quality because the quality of the accusers that come forward after Joe Paterno's uh, firing are even more garbage than those that before Jerry Zandusky's arrest. I mean, the, there were two accusers that were added to the indictments for the trial, victims number nine and victims number 10. Victims number nine story, Sebastian Baden, who, by the way, got paid $20 million, $20 million, is so preposterous, so inconsistent with every other story told. There were people at trial who... Who who thought for sure he was the least credible accuser? He's the one talking about screaming in the basement and blood in his underwear, even though there's no evidence of that. Um, I mean, he uh, you know the idea that Dottie Sandusky was baking cookies 15 feet away from. I've been in that basement. There, I mean, Matt Lauer was in that basement. It was like there's no no this didn't happen. There's no way you go down in that basement. There's just no way. You, if anyone, if there's nothing unusual about the basement, and it's literally a few feet from the the kitchen door, uh, and there, you can hear everything. Um, and so, you know, Dottie Sandusky has to be an accomplice. The, his story is preposterous, but at least he knew Jerry Sandusky. Victim number 10 didn't even know Jerry Sandusky, never met Jerry Sandusky. That's the, and that's, those were the two best accusers they got after arrest, after Anthony Sassano said they were going to get all sorts of great evidence. They got horse manure. So they have a victim that got paid millions of dollars that was never even the same room as Jerry Sandusky? See, I didn't know that. Well, because the only way you could prove that is if you had the information I have. I mean, I'll give you a funny story about that. So when I get leaked, or I, I didn't get leaked. I got indirectly leaked. The, all the settlement information. I, I flew from Los Angeles to Philadelphia to, 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 for two days to go through boxes and boxes of all the settlement information. And it was, I expected it to be garbage and it was so much worse than i possibly expected it was it was comical comical but one of the um you know one of the things that happened was i got the names of all those that got paid so i go separately to jerry and to dotty sandusky because i can email jerry and i you know i can contact dotty sandusky who i've appeared with on the today show with matt lauer and i i said separately I want you to mark for me on these 36, 37 names. Who do you know? Who do you definitely not know? And who, do you, who aren't you sure about? And uh, their lists were almost exactly the same, which is interesting. Almost exactly the same. 
One of the very few differences in their lists, by the way, about half of them they did not know. About half the, the guys that got paid by Penn State, they had no knowledge of who they were. But uh, the, one, the major difference I saw was that Jerry had marked that he knew victim number 10. And I said, wait a minute, how is that possible? You guys have been telling me emphatically for years that you didn't know victim number 10. And Jerry's explanation was, well, I didn't know him until the trial, and I met him at the trial. <laughs> I'm thinking, you've just, you've just now understand Jerry Sandusky. That's Jerry Sandusky in a nutshell. Naive, honest to a fault, and completely oblivious to the overall reality he's facing. I think the, the troubling thing, and this isn't even a Sandusky case, this is a human case. Uh, what we want in a country that we live in. The presumption of innocence is precious. I think we've lost it. But in that story, I didn't think about it at the time. I was along for the ride completely and with no questions asked. But looking back at it, revisiting it, there was no process of using the term accusers. It was the story broke and there are victims. And that wasn't just the news media. I know you, you, you know, hammer and wail away at the media and plenty of fair criticism there. But it came from key Penn State figures. We've talked about it a little bit. The firing of Paterno itself was uh, sort of an indictment of Sandusky, I think, in the public mind. Certainly in mine. I can speak for myself. Of course. I want to play a couple examples. So we'll start with your buddy, Scott Paterno. This is (laughs) Joe Paterno's son. Now, keep in mind, this story just broke. Joe Paterno has not been fired at, at this point. Sandusky is months and months away from trial. This is, this is, there's no victims now. There's allegations that have been made and an investigation ongoing, and this has not been litigated yet. So this is Scott Paterno on the Joe Paterno family lawn talking to Penn State fans in the immediate aftermath of this story sort of collapsed. Gentlemen, 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 thank you very much. Guys, we, first off, really, we really appreciate it. We really appreciate the show's support. And before you guys continue cheering, can we just take a minute and say a prayer for the guys? Oh, look, no matter yeah. how this works out, there's a horrible story that involved a lot of kids getting hurt. And as a father of three kids, I just can you guys take a moment, say a prayer, and then please feel free to cheer, feel free to show your support. But let's remember that we're going to show the support for the victims first. Cool. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I have nothing more to say. This was for them. Thank you very much, guys. Scott Potato! Okay, so we have there, we have the, the word victim is used, and these it's said as a matter of fact that these terrible things had happened to these kids, and this is, you know, what should be top of mind at this point. And I was agreeing with them at the time. I saw that, you know, minutes after it happened live, after the fact, and I agreed with him in real time. I want to jump to his father, Joe Paterno, kind of hitting the same note on his porch in, in this whole you know, same firestorm. Joe Paterno asking the Penn State fans to pray for the victims. When I say guys, you know what I mean. You know what I mean, girls, too. All right. Hey, look, get a good night's sleep. All right, study. All right, we still got things to do. All right, I'm out of it maybe now. A phone call put me out of it, but we'll go from here, okay? Hey, good luck, everybody. Hey, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Pray a little bit for those victims. Coach, we are legendary. We wanted to show the whole thing, you know, to give the full context of that exchange. But the the key point is at the end that you know, pray for the victims. This was the official line of everybody at Penn State before any trial had taken place. This is look again. I can only speak for myself, but I think my experience is typical. This thing was done before it began. The presumption of innocence is gone. Whatever you think of Jerry Sandusky, you can sit here, hate me, never watch my show again, go harass John on Twitter. It wouldn't be, you're not the first one to take a crack <laughs> at him there. Believe me, I see it every day. I saw it in the last 72 hours quite a bit and related to this show. That's all fine, but just as a general principle, to go right to guilt in any situation, it is contrary to our founding principles. It's contrary to the Constitution, and I think it's problematic. 
And I think it set up an impossible situation. I think, that, for one, this the fact that this trial took place five, six months after the fact is very fast. I know not everyone understands that. But the fact that it took place in Pennsylvania, you can hate Jerry Sandusky. You can think that John is full of shit. But I think it, it should be 100% understood that a change of venue in this situation, this thing should have taken place in North Dakota, any place but Pennsylvania. It was impossible. Possible for this to be litigated fairly. Is that fair? Absolutely. And unfortunately, one of the reasons that didn't happen was because Jerry Sandusky was so naive that he thought that the, that the more Penn Staters that were on his jury, the better for him, which was the exact opposite for reasons that you just actually are illustrated because of those clips from Scott and, and Joe. Those clips, especially the Scott clip, the Joe clip, Joe's that's an afterthought. That's something Scott told him to say and he forgot. And, uh, and he throws that in there at the last, at the last minute, that statement from Scott. And to be clear, I hate him. He hates me. Uh, We have a legendary, uh, I don't know if you call it a feud or whatever, but we hate each other with great passion. But that moment where it was February 8th, the evening of November 8th, 2011, that was the, the final nail, in, in my opinion, in the coffin of this story. We were already starting, to mix a metaphor, to leave the gravitational pull of the rational earth. But once Scott Paterno goes on the Paterno family lawn, that's his dad's house. His dad's not speaking at that point. His press conference got canceled. He's done no press interviews, no nothing. He's put out a written statement, but nothing in person. So Scott, his son, and his lawyer comes out on his lawn in the media's mind and in the minds of Penn Staters, he's speaking for Joe Paterno. He's his attorney. Uh, right. And he's, so, so effectively, Joe Paterno is telling the community, pray for the victims. Lots of boys got hurt here. This is a horrible story. Uh, and oh my God, the virtue signaling there was just pathetic. I mean, it's, it's, it, Scott has so many conflicts of interest in this story. One of them is he's a Republican lobbyist at this point. Well, this is a Republican governor, Tom Corbett, a Republican attorney general's office. So they have him by the balls. Scott Paterno is not going to go against This prosecution of Jerry Sandusky, in fact, from a strategic standpoint, he thinks, and I can understand if this was a rational world, how this might have worked. He thinks the way to save his dad is to bury Jerry as far and as fast as possible. But what he's too stupid to understand is we're not in Kansas anymore on this story. And the number one thing Toto, that the the Penn State Board of Trustees needs to not be sure of in order to get rid of Joe, right? They have to be sure Jerry is guilty, right? Because if they get rid of Joe and it turns out Jerry is innocent, they're all damned for all time. You know, their name is mud for eternity. So Scott just alleviated any concerns. And so he basically opens the door for the very next day for Joe Paterno to get fired. Because if I I used earlier the World War II Churchill, you know, Europe versus London, that's Scott saying, we're seeding Europe. Let's fight this war in London. In other words, Joe Paterno's backyard. Let's talk about whether or not Joe was guilty of a cover up. No, no, no. You got to fight this thing in, in, Paris, <laughs> so so because so that way you at least get some time. Uh, you know, time is everything here because you, I'm sure most people don't remember that Saturday they've got a home football game against Nebraska. It's the last home game of the year. Joe Paterno has just been the, the just uh, in the previous home game uh, just won his 409th win. He's the winningest coach in the history of college football. This is going to be a massive celebration of Joe Paterno's career. It's already presumed to be his last season. They stupidly announce 
later on that it is his last game, which then makes it even easier for the board to get rid of him because, one, he's not going to be around to bother them in the future. There's nothing to fear. And, two, now we've declared that that Nebraska game is a massive celebration. You can't have a celebration in this environment. So now they've got to get rid of him. And to this day, there are still members of the board of trustees that insist they didn't actually fire Joe Paterno. They just prevented him from going to the game. Effectively, that's what they. they there are members of the board of trustees that think that's what they did, and, and and so what Scott does there is a strategic blunder of such catastrophic proportions that it sets off this domino effect. Because now, not only does it allow Joe to get fired, it destroys any chance Jerry Sandusky has for a defense. Because I'd like people to use their brains for a second. Who are all of Jerry Sandusky's biggest supporters and friends? They are Penn State fans. And when it comes to a contest between loyalty to Joe Paterno or Jerry Sandusky, especially now that he's an arrested pedophile, who the fuck do you think they're going to side with? And when Scott Paterno, so so effectively, Scott Paterno just obliterated, obliterated Jerry Sandusky's entire defense, because now the message has been sent out to every alumnus, every football player who thinks they know Jerry, who is who their inclination is to maybe help him fund his defense or help, uh, you know, testify on his behalf. That's gone instantaneously. They can't get a phone call returned after that. Because, and then when Joe Paterno dies, Jerry Sandusky goes from not just the pedophile that brought down Joe Paterno, he's the pedophile that killed Santa Claus. I mean, so he, he, there, you, 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 there is no chance in seven months of, of putting forward a defense in that environment. And that's even before Penn State starts immediately dangling money. Again, people don't remember, Justin. But to me, I still cannot believe that that Friday, that Friday, we don't know a name of any of these accusers. We know nothing. Mike McQuarrie has not done a public interview at this point, not an interview. All we have is a fragment of his grand jury testimony in a grand jury presentment, which is nothing but the prosecution just throwing shit against the wall and hoping it sticks. We know nothing. And Penn State cancels their pep rally that Friday and replaces it with a 10,000-person candlelight vigil where all the major figures at the university are standing there with their candles lit for these accusers, these victims. They don't know from Adam. They know nothing. They don't even know Jerry Sandusky. And then that Saturday before that Nebraska game, this has never happened before, nor since. Before the game starts, on national television, on ESPN, carried live, without interruption, both teams meet at midfield and say a prayer for the victims. Victims they know nothing about. Now, you tell me, how, how the hell you're able to mount a defense in that environment? It's impossible, and it wasn't based on evidence. It was based on nothing more than Penn State fired Joe Paterno and Graham Spanier. Therefore, obviously, Jerry Zanuski must be guilty. And I get that. I get because I bought into that too. But when you understand the dynamics of what was really going on behind the scenes and who Scott Paterno is and how the media works and who, who the people involved in the story were and the – and the, the vulnerabilities of Joe Paterno being 84 years old, when you're, I'm sorry, he was there for 61 years. I don't care how beloved you are. When you're in a place for 61 years in a position of power, you are going to piss people off. Especially Joe Paterno was, was not a warm, fuzzy, you know, people think of him as a grandfather figure. But most of the people I know him do not, that knew him well, do not describe him that way. He was a prickly guy. He was a, he was a pain in the ass. At times, he, he was not somebody who it was easy to like, especially when you got on his wrong side. And so there were enemies and those enemies saw an opportunity and they took him down. 
And there was a, and I, you mocked me before, but I believe the governor of the state who was interested in the Sandusky prosecution and John Surma, who was the head of U.S. Steel at the time, who wanted Paterno gone because his nephew had gotten screwed over by Joe Paterno, that was a, if you want to call it a conspiracy, there was an alliance. There was an alliance there. And they took over the Penn State Board of Trustees. And it was not, this is, sounds like a very minor detail, it was not the chairman of the board that announced Joe Paterno's firing. John Sermon was the vice chairman. That was one of the first things I thought was weird. I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. What? This is the most important thing the Penn State Board of Trustees has ever done in its history. And the chairman is not only not making the announcement, he's not even sitting at the desk. He's in the third row. I'm like, there's just been a coup. That's a coup right there. That's what happened here. And so you have to eliminate, that's all we started this interview, you have to eliminate from your mind when it comes to Jerry Sandusky the idea that, well, Penn State wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't real. And as far as the money is concerned, first of all, this is paid mostly by insurance. It's a state school. This is not their money. This is not a corporation that these people are, are pay- they're using other people's money to make them look good in the media. I want to talk yeah. about Governor Corbett really quick. He's, he's come up a couple of times. I, I'm curious if you find this problematic for the sitting governor of the state of Pennsylvania at the time. Governor Corbett gets in front of the microphone and says, I told Ugh. the board of trustees to remember the 10 year old boy in the shower. And he, he's advising their decision. Now, he later denied having said that. Which that is amazing. Because it's on tape. Right. Uh, uh, what you just said is amazing. Okay. The governor of the state bragged the day after Joe Paterno was fired that I told, I, I don't remember the exact verbiage, but it was something close to what you said. Remember the boy in the shower. I don't remember if you said 10 year old or not. But, but then a few months later, he is asked about that allegation and denies ever having said it. It's on tape at a press conference. Now, I'm glad you raised that because, first of all, the fact that he denied it, that was, see, I'm looking at this whole case from Southern California from a completely different prism than everyone else's. When I saw that, I'm like, he doesn't like the boys in the shower story because he needs to get off that train. And, that's, and I believe that's what happened. I, well, I, I believe he found out about Alan Meyer's statement that was given on November 9th, and he's like, well, yeah, I didn't say anything about the boy in the shower. That's a totally I, valid I, theory, John, I, I, but that's what I was getting at was whether he's right or not or whether it was the right thing to do or not morally, you can't prejudice the case like that. Well, and as a government official, the highest one, the executive of the state, d- Justin, saying that he's guilty before the trial. Justin. I think we saw with the Joe Biden, you know, situation in Minnesota, where you can't do that. Even if he's guilty as fuck, it doesn't matter. This makes this makes what Joe Biden did in Minnesota seem like child's play because this is way before the process begins. Months. And, uh, but but I, I cannot tell you how close to home you just hit because this has been an issue between me and Jerry Sandusky's appeal attorneys on a constant basis. I have been screaming from the mountaintops that of all of Jerry Sandusky's appeal issues, and he has many. I believe he actually has too many. I, I really do. I think he has so many legitimate appeal issues, it's difficult to get any of these people to focus on any one of them. Uh, I mean, he's, but to me, one of his most powerful is you have the ultimate state actor, the governor of the state, not just prejudicing. The public, by saying, you know, the boy in the shower must have been abused, essentially, because you're, you're telling the board to remember the boy in the shower when, you, when you're asking them to vote to fire Joe Paterno and, I guess, Graham Spanier. But, it, but here's what people don't understand. It took me a while to understand. He's a member of the board of trustees when he does this. He's voting and urging others on the board to vote with him to fire Two of Jerry's most important witnesses. Now, if that doesn't get you a new new trial, I don't know what does. That is the state of Pennsylvania, through the governor, proactively acting in a way to discredit a defense's witness list by firing them from their state-run jobs. That, to me... I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I know enough to be dangerous. 
a federal court would look at that and go, what the flying fuck? No, but you but, can't uh, have it. I, I, again, the Sandusky's innocence, guilt, whatever, is totally irrelevant in this situation. The point is you just can't do that. There's a reason why those laws are in place, and there's a reason why entire cases have been invalidated. There's a precedent for it. We've seen that. You can't do that. And the same reason Joe Biden hit a sliver. And by the way, I know, I know you know, you, I voted for Joe Biden plugging my nose. I tend to lead more conservative, but I'm not like a Biden hater, but Biden basher. But it was an obvious problem for Joe Biden to chime in mm. on the case in Minnesota with Derek Chauvin because it's a violation of our very principles. You can't prejudice the jury, whether they're sequestered or not. They should have been much earlier in the Chauvin case, by the way, but that's a whole different show. It, it, you can't do it. And, there's, and it was done very publicly. The, the denial is just bizarre. I don't know. Denying something you said on tape is, is bizarre in itself, but it's just something procedurally. That's where I was. Very early on following your work, you convinced me within two weeks, not of Sandusky's innocence, but of Sandusky's denial of due process. I think if, if people aren't convinced with where you're landing on his ultimate innocence, fine. I don't even know how anyone can argue the procedural issues here. It was impossible for to get him a fair to, for him to get a fair trial. You've outlined all the reasons. Why. Episode nine of the podcast, with the benefit of hindsight, we start with the trial. It's trial part one. It's four hours plus long. I uh, we deal with a lot of the issues that you're just talking about, and they are many, and and they are stunning. I mean, there are there are there are so many things that are just shocking from from a due process standpoint about Jerry Sandusky's trial that are should be. Uh, absolutely abhorrent to anyone who cares about our judicial system. But I, I tend not to. Uh, Franco Harris is big on the due process issue uh, and believes that Jerry deserves a new trial. His main focus is Joe Paterno because th- that's always been his focus, and I'm fine with that. But even though the due process issue is important to me, I, t- I, t- I tend to shy away from it because it makes it sound like I'm trying to claim, well, the case against him just wasn't proven or it was a bad a trial. Technicality. Right, right, technicality. And I'm telling you, well, that's important. There, I, I'm with you, Justin. That's an important concept. That's not what I'm alleging here. I'm alleging that the whole thing didn't happen. And to go back to Oxum's razor, that's by far the simplest path here. The, the simplest path to making all the evidence that we have make sense to put, I, I consider this po- podcast with the benefit of hindsight to be uh, me taking this uh, picture puzzle that we were, that was created by the news media over the last 10 years. And I think any rational person would suggest that that puzzle has a lot of pieces that don't really fit. And it makes a picture that doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and I'm being kind. And what I do over 19 episodes is, I readjust the pictures of the puzzle in a way that all of a sudden fit perfectly and show a picture that you go, oh, wow. Why didn't we see this right off the bat? Why didn't we even consider that that's what happened right off the bat? Because it is such a simpler narrative. (laughs) Naive former coach gets caught in a perfect storm post-Catholic church abuse scandal because he's got boundary issues and he grew up in a rec home where everyone was nude and he's, he's asexual and, and, and all these things that are, that most of the public doesn't know. And there's a money grab. The prosecution becomes invested. The media becomes invested. Joe Paterno gets fired. And then once that happens, there's no going back. It has a momentum of its own that cannot be reversed. And, uh, and then, you know, just to finish on the Joe Paterno aspect, you know, those settlement, uh, you know, because I've talked a lot about how once you're invested, you never go back. And what I, I have found in many stories that when the media is invested in a story, they will they will buy anything, any data point that seems to justify their original stance because they don't want to admit that they're wrong or be seen as being wrong. The biggest bunch of bullshit in the whole case is those so-called 1970s accusers that claim that Joe Paterno uh, knew about their abuse and told them to go basically pound sand, uh, leave me alone. 
And it's so obviously so. Even before I knew the identities, when I learned the identities of these guys, especially one of them, I mean, that's to me one of the most hilarious parts of the podcast is when we get into who these guys are. But the stories themselves are so ridiculous. And the, the fact that nobody ever doesn't take really, I think, complex thinking to understand what really happened there. Why is it? And this goes back to the HBO Al Pacino movie where Joe Paterno forgets that Jerry Sandusky is a pedophile somehow. So how is it that Joe knows he's a pedophile in the 70s? <laughs> and is, when, by the way, Jerry is a nobody. Jerry is a nobody. He's barely even on the staff. But Joe keeps him on the staff <laughs> with, with, without any repercussions whatsoever. By the way, after the second accusation, helps him start a charity for at-risk kids, which is just, come on, people. You're getting uh, into, like, cartoonish right, level right, evil right, at right. that point. But not only this, yeah. but Jerry has no leverage, right? So then, so then we, we flash forward 20-some years. And there's another allegation against Jerry, and they still do nothing. Even then, after he's no longer on the team, he's no longer coaching, so we're still going to keep this cover-up going? Here's what really happened, and this should have been obvious to anyone with a freaking clue. None of these other allegations, from the 70s till uh, McQuarrie, or, uh, there, there's uh, this massive gap of when Joe Paterno supposedly knew nothing. No one says anything about Joe Paterno. Well, why is that? It's not because Joe Paterno forgot or no one, people stopped telling him or whatever. It's because the, the accusers have a statute of limitations problem. There's, it's not a coincidence that the two oldest allegations against Jerry Sandusky in the settlements are the ones that mention Joe Paterno. Because as you go further and further away from being outside the statute of limitations, in other words, you're too old under the laws of Pennsylvania, your case loses its power to get a settlement from Penn State. So if you're that old that you're you were at the time the age when you could be abused in 1971 or 1976, you need something extra to get Penn State's attention. And the best way to get Penn State's attention is, I know, I told Joe Paterno about this, and he told me to go away. And that's what happened here. That, 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 and, and, and by the way, uh, Penn State didn't believe those stories because those guys got very little in re in relative terms almost no money they uh, i mean they it was basically just go away uh and uh and we even have an audio tape from the guy who gave the money out from Penn State who says quote a lot of these guys were on the gravy train a lot of the stories were exaggerated we we you know uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now but we we had a lot we we gave these guys money so they would go away Ira Lupert is his name and that's part of the podcast as well. So I wish people would at least use their damn brains. I mean, but the media ran with those 70 stories about Joe Paterno with zero scrutiny. I mean, it was copy and paste and off to the races. Oh, it's enticing and, for them. You know. Well, the most important thing was it justified their initial rush to judgment. See, they, they rushed to judgment against Joe Paterno in 48 hours. And then they killed him and they destroyed his career. They desperately want that to be true. And so when they get these stories, oh, he knew from the 70s, even though that makes no damn sense in the larger narrative, they're not going to give it any scrutiny whatsoever. And, and as we prove in the, in the podcast, those stories are beyond a joke. They're literally a joke. I want to I put you back into November 2011. And, you know, you mentioned you're not an attorney, but... <laughs> You probably would have done better than Joe Amendola, but I'm curious. We, we've discussed the poor hand, the poor legal hand Jerry Sandusky was dealt, this mountain he had to climb. He had a burden to defend himself that is not supposed to be the burden in this country anyway. He was, by definition, if we've ever seen somebody guilty until proven innocent, it was Jerry Sandusky. Take me into November 2011. You're advising Jerry Sandusky. You can go back in your, your DeLorean. Is there anything... He could have done, not before, not not showering with a kid 10 years earlier. From November 2011, seven months later, he's convicted. Could he have done something differently or was this so insurmountable? Different attorney. Should he have testified? 
Was there a path to exoneration for him that he <clears throat> well, didn't take? It's a little bit unfair because I have the benefit of hindsight, which is that's, the, well, that, that that's exact. <laughs> I'm asking you to apply the benefit of hindsight. Okay, with the benefit of hindsight, yes. which by the way, the reason why that's the name of the podcast because that's part of Joe Paterno's famous statement. Everyone always remembers him saying, "I wish I had done more." The media removed the first part of that statement, which was with the benefit of hindsight. Incredible qualifier, right? Yeah. I wish I had done more, and I'm sure that was written by Scott Paterno. Um, and you know, my, my view on Scott is well known. So with the benefit of hindsight, there are several things that could have changed the day. I don't I I personally believe once Joe Paterno is fired, that's it. Um it, it's over with. But um I, I think that if if when the presentment comes down, if Jerry Sandusky had been smart enough to put the pieces of this puzzle together, because I actually am the one that helped him put the pieces of this puzzle together with Alan Myers. I, I, years later, and it took me way too long. I screwed up, especially on the date issue. But if he had immediately, see, people think that um, Jerry was like sitting around worried about a Mike McQuarrie episode for 10 years. He had no idea there was a Mike McQuarrie episode. He was never told Mike McQuarrie was, was the witness. He had a recollection that Alan Myers was involved in something that somebody saw, and he had offered Alan Myers up to Penn State Tim Curley, the athletic director, to speak to, to them, but they never took him up on it. If immediately they had gotten a hold of Alan Myers, like, you know, on, on November 7th, that Monday, and Alan Myers had had a press conference with Jerry Sandusky before the state did their press conference on that Monday, uh, and Alan Myers had convincingly said, I'm the boy in the shower. I don't know what the hell this is all about. Let me tell you about the Jerry Sandusky I know. I th think that would have at the very least bought time because then I don't believe Joe Paterno gets fired. If there's, a, if there's the boy in the shower contradicting as a sergeant in the Marine Corps, Mike McQuarrie immediately, I think at the very least everyone goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, hold your tickets, right? I mean, I think that's a rational that's a rational thought. Oh, it'd be a huge roadblock in the momentum that we saw build. In, right, in right. The reality. Right, order. right. I think, I think the narrative at that point would have become, okay, let's, let's wait and see what the hell's going on here. It becomes more in doubt. Right. Let, let's, let's wait here. And so certainly Joe doesn't get fired that Wednesday, and he coaches that Saturday against Nebraska, and he finishes out the season. And time is everything in these situations. You, when, I mean, I've been involved. This is not my first rodeo. It wasn't my last rodeo. I have been involved in some very high-profile situations where effectively I've been a crisis management counselor. And the number one thing, other than not panicking, is to buy time. You've got to buy time. Like, for instance, and I was saying this at the time, this is not with the benefit of hindsight, I believe that Scott's biggest mistake Scott's biggest mistake was when Penn State uh, cancels Joe Paterno's press conference on that Monday, because that was the moment where I'm like, okay, okay, look, look, it's over, it's over. You know, it, it, Penn State is 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 now setting off the dominoes, where I don't see how Joe is capable of surviving this, regardless of what the facts are, because now I know what the media narrative is. I mean, Penn State is preventing Joe Paterno from even speaking. How can he coach? I mean, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. I mean, so. If, if at that moment, Scott had said, all right, Penn State, you're going to do this to us. Go fuck yourselves. Uh, we're going to bring in Tom Rinaldi uh, into the uh, paternal family kitchen, and we're going to do a one-on-one -on -one between Tom and Joe. And Joe's going to you know, charm his socks off, and he's going to say, oh, I, I really don't remember what Mike told me, and I, I, it's troubling, but I, I don't know any of this, and I, let's just let the process take hold, you know, anything like that. Um, then that would have bought time. That would have bought everybody. Joe Paterno had more than enough personal credibility. Uh, but Scott, in my opinion, was so wedded to this, his technical notion of him being a lawyer. I, this is purely my guess, but it's a pretty darn good guess. He must have been afraid that Joe was going to be fired for cause for breaking his contract because Penn State told him he wasn't allowed to speak publicly. I'm like, 
what kind of a moron thinks that Penn State is going to fire Joe Paterno just after becoming the winning his coach in the history of college football because he decides to do a press conference that Penn State isn't approving of? There's there would have been riots in the street. There, there were riots the, when but, they when but, they thought he was fired for covering up a sex crime, right, right, let the, alone on that right. ground. There, there's no way. Yeah. It was it was a catastrophic miscalculation. So timing is everything in life. If if Alan Myers, and it took Alan Myers a little while to figure, see, because Alan, this to me goes to Alan not being abused. It took a little while for Alan to understand he was the guy be, because he never thought of himself as an abuse victim. But he's putting the pieces together as he's seeing the story on McQuarrie being reported in the news. The time period, which, by the way, was wrong. And there's an explanation for why Alan Myers gets confused by that. But there's there's a couple of things in Alan's statement that only the boy in the shower could have possibly known, specifically that there was a, a slamming of the locker door and that Jerry asked him whether or not he'd be willing to speak to Penn State. Those two things are. McQuarrie put that on. It was not in the public record at the time, but McQuarrie said that. And Tim Curley has has uh, has corroborated, as has Gary Schultz corroborated, that yeah, Jerry told them about who the boy in the shower was. Go ahead and contact. It. Uh, this was at the time period if you want to do so, and they never did. And so, if Allen figures this out a little bit faster and is willing to go all out, but see. The date is so important. Alan Myers gives that statement the afternoon of November 9th, 2011. My guess is he went home that night thinking, I, I'm going to be Jerry's biggest defender. And Joe Amendola thought, we've got the case nailed. We've got the boy in the shower. McQuarrie's credibility is going to be shot. We're going to win this case, which is partially, I believe, why the Bob Costas interview disaster happens, because Amendola is overconfident. And so um, what happens that night, though? That night, Joe Paterno gets fired. Grant Spanier gets fired. There's articles in Business Insider headline the next morning, Penn State on the, on the hook for $100 million in settlement abuse or abuse settlement uh, payouts and the Sandusky scandal. Every plaintiff's lawyer in the state knows. You know that that the the vault is open. Floodgates are open. Flood, floodgates are open. And by the way, as it turns out, Alan Meyer's mother used to work for a local attorney in State College by the name of Andrew Shubin. Andrew Shubin ends up representing nine, at least nine, of these accusers. One of them would be Alan Myers, uh, and I don't think that's a coincidence. Uh, it, it's it's pretty obvious that Andrew Shubin put two and two together, knew that Alan was close to Jerry and informed his mother and Alan, hey, uh, this could be very, very, very good for you guys. And, um, and by the way, we sent a purposely fake accuser to Andrew Shubin's office and they engaged in a, I shouldn't say we. I, should, I was going to ask you, who's we? Yeah. I, I, you did, right? Well, I didn't even, I, I suggested it. Uh, his name is A.J. Dillon. It's part of the podcast. You can see this bonkers four and a half hour interview, two interviews together that we did with him, Liz Habib and I did, at framingpaterno.com. He did a three-year-plus sting operation on Andrew Shubin and Andrew Shubin's therapist. He has, I don't know, dozens and dozens of hours of recordings of his conversations with Shubin and the therapist. He has documentation. They bought his ridiculous story of abuse by Jerry Sandusky hook, line and sinker. Uh, and, and not only did they buy it, they uh, Shubin, we have him on tape telling AJ Dillon what his real story was. And it wasn't his story. In other words, Dylan tells him one silly, ridiculous story of being abused behind Joe Paterno's house at a park, <laughs> which he just came up with on his own. I wanted to be as I wanted it to be as, as stupid and as organic as possible, and AJ did not disappoint. Uh, and uh, and and Andrew uh, Shubin does not like that story. So at their second meeting, you hear him at the computer, and he's he's going down the bullet points of AJ's story. 
Except it's not his story. And you have evidence of this. Uh, it's all on tape. Yeah. And, yeah. and in fact, he references the story in the park, and he says, we'll talk about that later. What Schumann is doing is he's telling AJ, you have a new story. You told people at Penn State this. This happened on Penn State's property. Because Schumann knows what Penn State might pay for. They will pay for situations that Penn State knew about. They will pay for situations that occurred on Penn State's property. And they really like paying for multiple episodes of horrific abuse. And, uh, and, and by the way, at least two of the trial accusers completely, I mean, I'm not exaggerating in the slightest bit, completely change their stories when it comes time to get their money. Because their lawyers figured out that, wait a minute, the story we told at trial is nowhere near good enough to get the big bucks. The big bucks is for the guys who got raped constantly in Penn State's showers. So even though there was no testimony to that at trial, all of a sudden, for victims three and victims five, the, the floodgates have completely opened. And one of my favorite lines in all the settlement documents is that the lawyer, by the way, who I think was Shubin, well, I think, I'm, I, don't quote me on this, but I'm, my recollection is that it was Shubin, who was victim number three's attorney, who says the full extent of victim number three's uh, uh, abuse was not elicited at trial, and, and which I thought must have been remarkable news to the prosecutors, right? Because the prosecutors worked on that for quite a long time, and he withheld a whole lot of abuse uh, and a whole lot of uh, episodes and a, and a whole lot of evidence, uh, and, all, and it just happened to dovetail with what Penn State was paying for. Uh, and so when people listen to the entire A.J. Dillon interview, I, I think they will, um, well, they'll be entertained because it is it is by far the most bonkers part of this whole thing. I mean, this guy, A.J., is way more obsessed with this case than I am. I mean, he is a former Second Mile kid who knows that Jerry is innocent. Oh, so that's his motivation is to exonerate Jerry Sandusky? He know, he, yeah, he, yeah. Know, he, he, knows, he knows Jerry. He attended the trial. Uh, you know, he just, he knows he's innocent. What do you think and, of, and by the way, he knows some of the accusers, which is part of why he knows he's innocent. I, I want to live in a, like a parallel universe where I can relive this case just as an observer, but where Jerry well, Sandusky takes the stand. Well, it's he should have taken the stand, but it was too, but by the time, so you asked me with the benefit of hindsight, Yeah, I, I went back to Alan Myers on November 7th doing a press conference because then that changes a whole series of dominoes. If the dominoes are still falling in the way that they did, by the time Jerry testifies at trial, it's not going to be of any value. You don't think it helps? It, it, well, I mean, I, I think that Jerry would have been compelling. I mean, having interviewed him for six hours in prison and on the phone, he's a compelling witness when he's not, you know, saying stupid shit. Um, but, I mean, his story makes sense, and he's sincere, and he, I've never caught him in a lie. I've tried to catch him in a lie for... However many years, I can't do it. I wish I could because then I could be rid of this stupid case. You famously so, sat with him two separate times, collectively about six hours in prison, right? Correct. Famously uh, sneaking in a recorder pen that you super glued and then couldn't get to, <laughs> couldn't get apart. I think you had to find right. some hit expert right. to do that. Right, that was hilarious. So you're, you're sitting there. Give me like sort of the human element. You're sitting there. I mean, we've talked about all the facts. The facts are what drive this, obviously. But just man to man, you're sitting there with Jerry Sandusky. You come to this conclusion in your head. You're convinced that he's innocent. You're sitting there. I, I didn't. I didn't come to that conclusion my, during my first interview. With no, him. but no. by the time you get through the second interview, right, you were right, there, right? right you were. Right. You were convinced. Right. Pretty much. Yeah. You're pretty much convinced. You're at that point. The guy can't even scratch his head because he's, he's cuffed so. Quickly. Right. Right. What's going through your head? You're sitting across from this guy that you think is has to be in your mind the unluckiest guy in the world. Just by the way, as Bob Costas suggested he might be in that interview. I don't know if you remember that part, but I don't. But Bob, Bob Costas puts together to use your Oxum's razor <laughs> analogy, he he says there's basically two possibilities here. You're either the most unluckiest person on the face of the earth or you're or you're guilty. Well, and I mean and so, you and I are not going to presumably end up in prison with dozens of accusers. It just wouldn't happen to us. He Are you kidding? I'm incredibly because of this case, I'm incredibly vulnerable. I'm incredibly vulnerable. I, I can't even go near a kid. I have two young daughters, uh, eight, eight and four so years old. I, I, can't, I can't even go near a kid on a playground. You were a high school coach, you said. I will so. never coach again. So that's I, you, you, I will never coach again. Because nor, of your work on well, this case. 
in, in bo- works in both directions. No one's ever going to hire me because all they have to do is Google me and they'll see you're what? A, you're a pedophile what? defender. Right, so. right, right. And, right. and I, 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 it's, I would be way too vulnerable. I mean, my wife, hopefully, mostly jokingly, uh, references this all the time. That, I mean, I would be the easiest person on the planet to make a false accusation about. Well, uh, it, it, okay. I mean, it, it, so, but your case, your case, I guess it would be a targeted situation. I don't think these things fall out of the sky. I think he, if he is in fact innocent, he is the unluckiest guy ever. But at the end of the day, he's come- also very naive. He does. He deserves a lot of blame for what happened here. Well, His he was- wife deserves blame for what happened here. They were unbelievably naive. They should have seen this coming from a mile away. Uh, you said there's nothing they could have done in November. What, what no, well, should they well, have no, done? Because this story didn't begin in November. No, no, I know. But <laughs> I'm asking you upstream of that. I don't know. I mean, I don't. I think it's weird that he was showering with other kids after he was. I warned understand up. why people think it's weird. I mean, that, I wouldn't let my kids. It, it didn't happen nearly as much as people think it. See, yeah. that goes back to what is Penn State paying for? The reason why we have a whole bunch of stories of kids showering with Jerry at Penn State. Why? Because that's what Penn State was paying for. Yeah. So, so it checks so, the so, box. So I if you that. if you create a market, you create a massive market. For for a story, guess what's going to happen? You're going to get a lot of those he's, stories. He's showering with everybody. <laughs> but I want to get back. You're sitting there with him. Take me there. You're at the end. This guy's innocent in your mind. That's where you landed. The second interview, yes. Yeah. At mm-hmm. the end of the second interview. It just, were you heartbroken? You're, you're, all, you're all fire and brimstone with this case, and I get that. But just the human side of you, I, it's got to be the saddest thing ever, I would think, if that's the conclusion. I have a, I'm, I have a lot of mixed emotions because um, – from a personal standpoint, I, I'm dreading this. I don't want this. I do not want this at all. Let me give you the, the, the evolution because it's important for context. The first time I interviewed him was in, in uh, late winter 2013. I go in there convinced he's guilty. I'm open to the idea that maybe some of these things are exaggerated. Maybe there's some things that he didn't really do. But, but I'm only really concerned about the paterno Penn State angle. Nothing in the interview made sense. The feeling I was getting did not make any sense. What he was saying didn't make any sense consistent with him being a pedophile. But I was not, that wasn't going to be enough for me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go on the Today Show and, the, and declare Jerry Zanowski innocent based upon an, a feeling and, you know, none of this makes sense and there's not a lot of evidence, especially when this goes back to the perfect storm. I'm being told by people like Franco Harris, don't go there with Jerry's innocence because that'll hurt the cause of defending Joe Paterno, which was my initial cause. So it, it, that's the uniqueness of this case. The defense of Joe Paterno actually harmed the defense of Jerry Zanuski. But if Jerry Zanuski is innocent, there's no need to defend Joe Paterno. So anyway, I go out, I get out of the prison and I'm, one, I'm very concerned about the super glue on the pen. Um, that's, that's number one, but my Justin, my brain is exploding because I'm like, Oh shit. If this is, if I'm, my instincts are right. My life is fucked because I'm the only one that can do anything about this. And there's no way I can win this. There's no way I can win this. I'm, I'm a non-celebrity, you know, documentary filmmaker of some note, uh, but nowhere near well-known or powerful enough to have any significant influence. But I also know myself well enough to know that if I become convinced he's innocent, I'm going to have to do something about it. I'm not going to be able to just let it go. Now, a lot of people have told me I should have just let it go. Um, your, your uh, wife probably was one. My of them. wife was. <laughs> my wife absolutely is in the category of people who wishes I would have let it go. But I, I then spent the next year. This is important. I spent the next year trying to disprove my instincts. I reevaluated the entire case, trying desperately to prove that Jerry was guilty, because I did not want this cross. I did not want this. People need to understand this. There are people actually out there who think I do this for attention, which is just asinine. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to my career by far. And so I, I, did, I, I couldn't prove him 
even close to guilty. I asked for a second interview with Dottie there. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure you've heard the story. I've told it many places before. But I became, I had a few lingering questions. And then I asked kind of a big picture consciousness of guilt question, which was, all right, each of you tell me, when was the first time you thought this might not all turn out okay for us? Now, knowing the nature of the story, and this was a very long story. I mean, this thing goes from 1998 to 2012 when the trial happens. There's a thousand different data points if you're guilty that you might look at and go, uh oh, we're, you know, we're in trouble, right? But there was only one data point if you're in, if you if you know you're innocent, and. Uh, and Jerry, as you've already referenced, he's, he's you know, shackled down by his waist and uh, he starts crying. And in great detail, he uh, explains what happened when he heard the reading of the verdicts and that that was the first moment that he thought, "Uh oh, this might not be OK for us. And then Dottie, in even greater detail, with more emotion and more tears, says exactly the same situation, the reading of the verdicts. and. So I get out of prison and I'm still thinking, all right, is it somehow possible that this is a con? I mean, I knew it wasn't, but it, I'm, I'm looking for every possible angle here that I'm being played. And I call Joe Mandola, with whom I still had a good relationship at that time. And I said, Joe, I just asked Jerry and Dottie in prison, when was the first moment that they thought this might not turn out okay? And Joe paused for a moment and said, was it the reading of the verdicts? And I'm like, okay, all right, the, 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 that's it. Because there's no consciousness of guilt there. there and you can't fake, you, if you were there, there was no faking this. This was as real and as raw as it could possibly get. And when you understand that they're both very religious people, that's another part of this. The fact that they're religious people. The religious person is always going to think, especially the deeply Christian Protestant religious person, is always going to think, Jesus or God is going to make this okay. If we have faith, it's all going to turn out okay. God has a plan. And it's only at the reading of the verdicts when you realize, wait a minute, where the fuck's the plan? Although Dottie would never say fuck. Dottie says that now. Even that this is part of, I saw that in one of her interviews. She said, I don't know if you, I'm sure you did say anything I've seen. I'm sure you've seen. But she, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but she said, you know, it's part of God's plan and you know, we're dealing with what we were dealt with here, but uh, I think that did Jesus, frame. Jesus and religion plays a huge role in all of this in ways that people who have not followed it or aren't on the inside could never possibly yeah. understand. And it has been a great source of frustration for me as someone who grew up Catholic and is now agnostic. And by the way, it's basically destroyed my relationship with Dottie. I mean, Dottie and I hate each other. Mostly because of the religion issue. She hangs right. up on you a lot. Is this what well, I well, no, I mean, we don't even talk anymore. But she used to hang up on me whenever I cursed. I, she, I think, if I cursed, she would. This is this is the church lady we're talking about here. This is the woman accused of of enabling her husband to rape young boys. When I curse, she would immediately hang up on me on the phone. Come on, people. I mean, use your goddamn brains. I thought it was interesting that on the eve of the trial, Jerry Sandusky calls his attorney, Joe Amendola, and says to him, paraphrasing, can't we just talk to these guys and work this all out? Joe I, told me that story. And, and yeah, that was, that was a, I think it was a couple weeks before the trial. A couple weeks. Okay. Right. So yeah. Jerry was still so naive. That he thought this was just a few conversations away from fixing. I mean, could you imagine like Larry Nasser <laughs> asking his, you know his attorney, like, hey, can we just talk to these thirty seven gymnasts and just uh, wear this away? I mean, it's just it just it's not an exchange that would take place. I thought that but, was a but you need to understand. Well, thank you. Uh, you need to also understand the context here. At this, at the time of Jerry's arrest, he's still in close contact with. Several of these accusers. I mean, to almost not quite the day of the arrest, but almost the day of the arrest. They're sending him Father's Day texts. They're they're coming over with their kids to have dinner at his house. How much I mean, time do we have? I don't know. It's uh, Matt Sandusky, the Matt Sandusky story. Well, yeah. Is that that's a whole other, you know. Well, his, no, I mean, and people but, ask about Matt Sandusky, and to me, Matt Sandusky is the whole case in a nutshell. Uh, it's amazing that people believe his story. His story is ridiculous. 
His, his story is a lie. It has changed every time he's told it. He used to be Jerry Sandusky's biggest defender until in the middle of the trial, he went in there. He, he was sitting next to Dottie on the first day of the trial. He was sitting in the family section next to Dottie Sandusky the first day of the trial. In my opinion, what happened was he looked around and saw, holy shit, everyone is believing this. Oh, my God, Brett Houts, victim number four, just took the stand, and he sounded pretty believable, and everyone was nodding in agreement. Jerry's going down. I need to make a decision pronto because my name has just gone from gold to, to mud, and you know my ability to make money, have a career, is, is shot. I mean, he, he was adopted by the Sandusky's at his own, and, is at his own request. At the age of eighteen, so he makes this. He makes this decision watching victim four. He's sitting in the pew, and he later goes on to act on that and act he on. He goes. The clip. By the way, who, who babysits his children? While Dottie, he- Body, Dottie, who's in, as naive as it could possibly be. So the fact that Dottie has come to this conclusion tells me that it's very obvious because she's even even able to put the pieces together. It, it is my opinion, based upon my discussions with Dottie. That Matt decides to have Dottie babysit his kids so he can go to the police to become a victim of Jerry Sandusky. And, and that's just one of a thousand data points about Matt that are just total uh, obvious uh, indications of a lie. Uh, this is a guy who, when he finally spoke, and he went on the speaking circuit after you know he became uh, semi famous. By the way, to me, this is an important story. I, I don't know whether or not people perceive it the same way. But, you know, after he becomes a victim, he, I don't say famously, but it got enough news coverage that it was part of the narrative. He changes his name. He changed his name to Matt Dennison. David, Davidson? I Davidson, think? I think. Yeah, yeah. Davidson. Matt Davidson. And, um, and, you know, I'm not a Sandusky anymore, you know. Right? Okay, whatever. Well, then he does his first interview with Happy Valley, uh, this bullcrap documentary that stars Andrew Shubin, the lawyer that we had the sting operation. You almost on. directed that piece. Yeah, I, I, I interviewed twice to direct it, and I spoke. I talked my way out of it. Although that would not have never have worked. You would have, they, they would have uh, fired you at some point. One hundred percent, one hundred percent, they would have fired me. But anyway, um, so uh, so Matt Sandusky is the star of this movie. Well, when when they premiere the movie and he's on the red carpet because all victims of child sex abuse, they, they love going on the red carpet of their movie where they're starring talking about being abused by their uh, adopted father that they asked to be adopt well after the abuse began and even stopped at the age of 18. Um, but he changes his name back to Matt Sandusky. Why? By the way, no, no there was no media coverage of this because Happy Valley doesn't get a headline. Matt Davidson stars in Happy Valley. No one gives a shit about yeah, it's that. It's a stage name. Right. So, yeah, so Matt, Matt Standusky, okay, that gets attention. And so Matt goes on the speaking circuit after this, and but he never speaks in Pennsylvania for good reasons, because people in Pennsylvania know he's full of shit. So he finally speaks in Pennsylvania, and um, I decide I'm going to go be there because I want to make sure he knows somebody there is willing to uh, call him out. And if I get a chance to ask a question or confront him or whatever, and also it's important to remember, and I ask, I would ask people go, I, I did a video on YouTube, the overwhelming case that Matt Sandusky is lying. Uh, and in part of that video is his interview with Oprah Winfrey and his interview with Oprah Winfrey was way, way worse than than the Bob Costas, Jerry Sandusky interview, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, he melts down to almost a comical degree when Oprah simply asks him, how do we know you're telling the truth? And then he lies about the money aspect of the whole thing when Oprah says, well, you took the money, right? And, uh, and he claims that he didn't know Penn State was paying money, which is just ridiculous. Um, and, and thankfully, uh, you know, Matt sold out his entire family his father, his mother, his siblings, they had salvaged him from a horrendous, horrendous upbringing. And he sold them all out for, I think, $325,000 minus attorney's fees. Because that's all he got from Penn State. Because Penn State didn't even believe him. Uh, you know, everyone else got, got millions. So in order to help fund this uh, scam that he's created, 
He goes on these speaking engagements, and I go out there, and boy, oh boy, do they know I'm coming. I mean, they- You registered under your own name. Registered under my own name. I did so at the last minute because I didn't want to give them a heads up. I, I mean, you know, I'm always very straightforward. I registered under an assumed name early on to make sure I got a ticket. I was going there for two reasons. One, to go see Matt Sandusky, and two, because I was going to go play golf at Oakmont Country Club just before the U.S. Open that year where they were hosting the U.S. Open, and, um, and which was very far away from where this was. So this was going to be a logistical nightmare. Anyway, um, but the day of, I registered in my name. So that, that, you know, therefore I was not, you know, doing it. And, and boy, oh boy, did that must have caused alarm bells. Because when I show up, there are police cars, police cars, multiple police cars already stationed outside of this event. This is, this, this is a speech by a sex abuse victim. There's, there's no need at a school, at a school, there's no need for police cars. I show up. And immediately, as soon as my name is read, uh, I am taken off to the side. I am spoken to. The police come over and basically get me to promise I'll, you know, abide by the rules. They've got all sorts of rules created. My favorite rule is no recordings. Now, your entire purpose as a, uh, to do speeches, right, is to spread your word about, you know, your, your horrible story of abuse. But you don't want recordings. What was your goal? You're sitting there. Was it to participate in a Q&A? If so, what I would you I didn't know. Have... I just wanted him to know I was there. Okay. So we... I was willing. That's how positive I was he's lying. I was willing to come across the entire country. And by the way, this was the most difficult part of Pennsylvania to get to. This is like in the far northeast, you know, up near like Allentown. Uh, it wasn't Allentown. It was close to Allentown. section of, of, of Pennsylvania. Impossible to get to from Los Angeles. And I, and I, I you know, took an incredibly long car ride and all, all that because I wanted to make sure someone was there to call him out on his bullshit. And I didn't know what way that was going to happen, whether I was going to get a chance to ask a question. So long story short, I go in and I sit down in the front row. And uh, the per- immediately the person running this is terrified of me and, um, and sits down and um, and I basically told her, I looked her right in the eye. I said, you have no idea what you're doing here. You are sponsoring an evil person who is lying and pretending to be a sex abuse victim. And she was scared out of her mind. Cause I mean, I looked, I mean, I was laser beamed in her eyes and, uh, and she was so scared that she let me sit in the front row. She didn't even tell me to move. And then I guess someone else must have thought, well, that's a bad idea. I, frankly, I think it was Matt. Matt, behind the curtain, behind the stage, saw me in the front row and said, oh, no, 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 I'm not coming out. So the police come down and remove me from the front row, even though I have a ticket in my own name and there's no, there, there was reserved seating, but I had been told by the person running this that I could sit there. So I stand up. There's video of all this. You can find it. Oh, yeah. We, we have it. Oh, okay. Yeah. You want to run it now? Or yeah, you... let's run it. So, yeah, Ben, throw this up. Oh. Okay. So this is, this is when you actually get This is later. So this kicked is, out. This is, so they come back to me, and they're like, uh, sir, you have to leave now. I'm like, leave why? I'm had you said anything? Zero. Be- okay, I, so I you was hadn't sitting done there. anything yet. I had just sat there. I was tweeting. I was just sitting there, and I'm like, I am not leaving. And now, now they're physically removing me. What, what did they say to you why you had to leave? Did they give you a reason? They, I don't recall any, yeah, any, any reason other than, um, yeah. sir, you have to leave me. This is what so, I mean, for, the truth. Uh, they physically dragged your ass. No, and, and that's, <laughs> that, that is the tip of the, of the iceberg. Now, there were they, charges against you, but they were all dismissed, right? All except for like a disturbing the peace. Oh, well, thing. who doesn't have that on the um, record? Uh, uh, the uh, no, this was a nightmare beyond comprehension. So I'm dragged out there. I've again, this is a public school. I have a ticket in my name. It's a public event. If if I was uh, if if I was in favor of a cause that the media liked, I would be a celebrity with a multi million dollar lawsuit against all sorts of entities there. The school. Uh, in fact, they, they forced me to sign away my legal rights in, in, the, uh, in the plea bargain. So um, 
So after that video gets stopped, and by the way, the guy who, who, who videotaped it, very nice guy, big supporter of mine, but this shows how pussified everybody is. He turned off the recording because he was afraid that if he got seen recording, that he might, you know, then get arrested or something. I mean, so the, the cowardice, the fear that, that it pervades this case impacts everything. So what you didn't see there is I get dragged across the floor and they open up the side doors of the, of the auditorium. They drag me through the side doors. They slam the side doors. And then they slam me to the ground, stomach first, take my hands behind my back. They step on my back. I have bruises. I have pictures of bruises on my wrists from the handcuffs being put, put on. I was, I, my whole body was... <laughs> I was trying. To, I tried to play golf the next day at Oakmont. Uh, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is half of a golf trip, <laughs> right? Right. But I mean, I'm playing the toughest golf course in America. And it's getting ready for the U.S. Open, and I'm, you know, I'm I'm bruised up, um, and I'm not I'm not exaggerating. I was physically beaten up by these police officers. It, it, it was, and I was not resisting. I was just being a rag doll, which is you know normal. Procedure. It's like a, like a four year old just kept right, the, right, dead, the dead right, weight. <laughs> right. And then, and then the funniest part of the whole thing is so they finally get me up on my feet and I'm handcuffed and they're dragging me away. And where do they drag me away to? They drag me to the area right behind the stage. And who's there? Matt Sandusky. You, you saw him? Yes. They, they literally oh, dragged man. me right to Matt Sandusky. So I started screaming at Matt Sandusky. What a. A lying fraud he is. Uh, I mean, and then then they take me to the police station, and it took out. I'm, I'm chained. I am chained, literally chained to. Uh, I don't know what it was—a a chair of some sort, a seating, you know, some bench. And uh, I have no. I I can't get to my phone. Uh, I I have no contact with anybody else. Uh, for hours, I'm sitting there, and uh, before I'm arraigned by some judge on, on Zoom. And I'm facing if, uh, charges that have convicted on all counts, I think it was 19 years in prison. Now, of course, that was never going to happen. But that's an incredibly daunting concept. I mean, I'm, I'm a dad in Southern California with a young child, and uh, you know, my wife is at home with her. And I mean, the, I was obviously in an incredibly vulnerable position, largely because of the politics of my position. Because I can't go in front of a jury because a jury is going to think of me as a, the same as Jerry Sandusky. Does your wife just mm. tell you in this situation, like, John, like, it's, you can't be doing this type of shit. Like, you're, you're going to get thrown in, in prison. You're, well, this, a, you're this, a dad. Just this one was let a, it go. This one was a this one was understandably a big moment for my wife. <laughs> this one this one uh I'm not sure how I got past this one. It was a winner <laughs> for the just let it go movement, I think. Yeah. Well, and it cost me it cost me about $6,000 cuz I had really shitty But this is uh, a money making. This whole thing's a money making venture for you. Yeah, right. a, That's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> yeah, uh, it cost me about $6,000 in 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 travel and legal costs to plea bargain this down to a hundred and some odd dollar fine. Um, and, um, and boy, oh boy, I, I wish I had had good legal re representation. You know, one of the things I've, I've many things I've learned, but if you're not from an area, don't get a lawyer from that area because they're beholden to the people in that area, not to you. And so uh, I don't believe I got good representation at all. But one of the things I was shocked by, I didn't think this was a big deal at all. I, I mean, I, I thought this was just me, a judge, my lawyer, you know, a prosecutor, whatever. So they finally, we plea bargain, and they bring me into this courtroom, and the place is packed. It's packed with everybody that was there that day. I mean, they were loaded for bear. They were terrified of me. And I wish I had known that because I would have. Come out I, with, like, the Hannibal Lecter uh, mask. No, they well, should have no. just wheeled you I, in. I would have been far less willing to plea bargain. Yeah. Because I didn't realize that they were, I mean, they were, oh, my God, they were scared. They were scared out of their minds. And they, yeah. and interestingly, in the deal, in the deal, I had, to, and this is one of the reasons why, I don't know, funny what goes through your mind in these situations. Uh, one of the reasons I took this deal was that in the deal, I had to uh, 
I had to th- legally give up my rights to sue all sorts of these entities, the school, the police force, the, I don't know, the county, the city, what, all the, all, but not Matt Sandusky. I, they, they, so these people didn't give a shit about Matt Sandusky. So I could have sued Matt Sandusky if I wanted. And frankly, I believe this was all on Matt Sandusky. I believe that Matt Sandusky was, was pulling the strings. I think they were afraid that if, you know, if Matt decided to not speak, that that's a terrible headline. Matt Sandusky event canceled because of, you know, Jerry Sandusky supporter or something, whatever it is. It's not I mean, a good headline. Right. And so, so Matt clearly told them, because the thing was, be, before the video that you saw, the event had already been delayed like 20, 25 minutes. So clearly what's happening there is there's a stalemate. I'm in the seat, just sitting there waiting, tweeting, minding my own business. And then Matt's finally said, no, I'm not coming out. And then whoever's in charge has now made the decision, we're going to get the police to get him out of there. I probably would have done the same thing. I mean, I, I'm a producer. I put on events all the time. I probably would have tried to throw you out too. I mean, I feel bad for that poor lady who confronted you initially because it's like in their head, this they, is a legitimate sexual abuse victim that is speaking, and it's someone. I mean, you know, there's there are people that, that think that every crime's a hoax, and that, that you know, there's people that think that uh, Mar- uh, Charles Manson, not Marilyn Manson, Charles Manson was great, and you were sort of mm. labeled with one of those kooks. So, I mean, I, I get why people. Let me, let me, but, but it's important to point out that uh, and I don't know what the current status is. It may have changed recently. I haven't checked it recently, but there's no sign of Matt Sandusky's foundation anymore. It's gone from Twitter. It's gone from the web. Uh, there's no sign that he, he's still occasionally doing. That old kind of Matt Davidson, actually. Is the, okay. Yeah. But my, my point is that my point, this is an important point. Yeah. That nobody is supporting the foundation, especially not in Pennsylvania, because people know he's full of shit. And I believe, I believe that even those people that were sponsoring this event left knowing he's full of shit. Oh, who knows? Yeah. I want to put you, let's, let's center this though. Cause we got it. We got a, you, you poor thing. You got to get back on a plane right. in like eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> so we get you some sleep tonight before that, uh, that flight in the morning. Let's get back in the high school civics class here. I want you to be forced, if you're willing to play ball on this, to take the other side. Take the, the side that you've gone against for the last decade. If you had to make the argument, the majority argument, that Jerry Sandusky is guilty, rightfully convicted, even if you don't believe every single one of the accusers, the ones in the 70s discard, but he's rightfully in prison. He got a just result. On, on whole, in mass, overall. What is the argument that you could even make? Because when I've looked at this, I don't see the evidence. I don't know why he's there, other than, obviously, the momentum and the avalanche. But if you had to make the argument, what is the argument? What's the counter? Because all I ever hear is what a piece of shit you are, how I'm stupid to have you on, how anyone that questions this. And look, I sympathize with those people. I empathize with them, in fact, because I was one of those people that thought this was a fait accompli, that this was ridiculous to mm. even question. That was the opening of the show. What is the counter to you if you had to counter yourself? Well, that's another great question. And the answer is so emblematic of the inherent problem with this case. There is an answer, and it's going to shock people it's gonna, because it goes against everything in the narrative. The best piece of evidence that Jerry Zandusky is guilty comes from the testimony of Joe Paterno. And Joe Paterno ends up getting destroyed because he's perceived as having led a cover-up for Jerry Zandusky. But the only evidence of any credibility that exists that Jerry Zandusky is guilty is Joe Paterno's 10-year-old recollection which I believe was manipulated by numerous people with an incentive to manipulate an 84-year-old man, his recollection of what Mike McQuarry told him 10 years earlier. That's the only evidence because he did refer to it in his his vague and short grand jury testimony as being of a sexual nature. Now, there's a whole series of reasons why I don't believe that that is actually true. But 
it's under oath. It's Joe Paterno. He's he's a man of you know unquestioned at that time character. No reason to lie. And so if if you're going to make the, the only way you can make the argument, this is but which by the way I think upsets the apple cart of the entire narrative because Joe Paterno is supposed to be one of the villains here. And people need to remember that on November 5th, 2011, the first article written about Joe Paterno's, uh, uh, L, L, you know, his part of the case here was written by Sarah Ganim, the Pulitzer Prize winner. And the headline read, Joe Paterno praised, praised for handling of sex abuse suspicions involving Jerry Sandusky. That was the original narrative by the Pulitzer Prize winner. And it, it's, it goes back to this whole the issue I've, I've raised several times where they can't paint a logical picture. They constantly contradict themselves. This, this picture puzzle that they create makes no sense. Which is it? Is Joe Paterno the villain who helped cover this up? Or is he the only guy who provides any credible evidence that Jerry Sandusky is actually guilty? Which is it? Because he's the, the, the if I, if, if you, if you were going to, Forced me to make a case of Jerry Sineski's guilt, I would, it would be all about Joe Paterno's testimony and interview, which he did in October of 2011, even more substantially backing up Mike McQuarrie's recollection. So it, it would be mostly about Paterno trying to shore up McQuarrie. Of course, it would be very difficult for me to, to defend Mike McQuarrie's story because I now know at least I believe I know, and Malcolm Gladwell and Gary Schultz and others believe I'm right, and Jerry Sandusky believes I'm right, that the entire McQuarrie date episode, the, the, the date of the episode is wrong. And it's not just a little wrong. It's catastrophically wrong because now there's a six-week delay from the time that Mike sees whatever he saw or hears whatever he's heard, and he goes to see Joe Paterno. Six weeks. That's not a rape. You don't wait six weeks to talk about a rape, especially when there's a reason why you do go see Joe Paterno the day after you find out that the job you wanted, the wide receivers coaching job, which had been held by Kenny Jackson, is opened up because Kenny Jackson just went to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now that's what happened there. That that makes a hell of a lot more sense. That that you suddenly call Joe Paterno on Saturday, February tenth of two thousand one, because on February 9th you find out that the job you wanted opened up rather than that just also happens to be the night you saw right. Jerry Sandusky raping a young boy in the shower. So we, we, <laughs> we forced you into high school civics class, but at the end of the day, putting a bow on this to get you, your, your poor soul to bed. <laughs> <laughs> so you got a flight in the morning. You don't have a scintilla of doubt regarding your conclusion. None, <laughs> not even I'm 99% sure it's, it's 100%. Is that, is that One, accurate? thousand percent okay well that's not possible but 100 percent <laughs> so here's what i'll say everyone in your camp and I, i've listened to a lot of the interviews you've done you know i've read your work for a number of years mm. everyone in your camp including you seems to have a different sort of pet thing that they think is the most compelling right. you know whether it's on its face exculpatory or just you know implies innocent i'll just give you mine I, i'll give you my oh, good. Oh, good. i'll give you my favorite reasonable doubt Okay. And I'm not saying it's the best. It's my pet one. It's my okay. the one that gives me the most pause. Okay. And it may be something you haven't heard before. I don't know. Oh, good. May I don't know. You mentioned it in passing. The lack of pornography in Jerry Sandusky's file, which is total. It is a total lack of pornography. Is the most compelling piece of evidence that in itself of course is not a smoking gun reverse smoking gun of, of exoneration. But to have a Serial, not one-off, a serial sexual predator. It doesn't even have to be a child predator of any variety. Have zero pornography in their file is unprecedented. And I try. Mm -hmm. I look into dozens of convicted sexual offenders, most of them of the serial variety, although in some cases only convicted of one, generally serial. I would challenge anybody watching this please find the example because I'm not saying I reviewed every one of the thousands and thousands of cases, but I looked at a very large sample. I can't find one. Larry Nasser was destroying hard drives loaded with pornography. Mm -hmm. 
It doesn't make sense to me that a serial, a, a, a sexual fiend, a, a, a guy that's just craving a hundreds of times with this one kid alone, has zero pornography, zero child pornography, zero anything. Legal adult pornography, anything. anything. Not just no child pornography, nothing, no, nothing. Which lends some credence to your theory about him essentially being asexual. I look. I have a friend. I'm not going to name him because that'd be pretty mean. But I have one of my best friends from high school. I consider to be kind of cut from that cloth, totally asexual, not gay, not straight, never had a boyfriend, never had a girlfriend, never dated, big sports fan. Guy has just no interest in anything. He's, he's basically an asexual guy. I, I, you know, that might be Jerry Sandusky, but I, I cannot find, and I challenge anyone to find one, anybody else that was convicted of these types of crimes that didn't have, obviously you have to go to a modern era. You can go back to the 1700s. I don't know what kind of porn <laughs> they had back then. But in the last 50 years, it had nothing, or certainly since the advent of the Internet, nothing, nothing at all. And, and th- this guy can barely operate a phone, let alone uh, somewhat, somehow destroy this evidence, which can always be pulled. Right. I, I just, I don't know where you stand on that. Well, no, I, I try to use the, I try to mention the pornography every chance I get. I agree. It's, it's the, you know, the pink elephant in the corner of the room that no one, doesn't make sense. <laughs> no one wants to talk about. I would add, by the way, it, within the realm of pornography, I would add, well, two things. The irony that there was pornography found in this case. Except it was found in the emails of the prosecutors, the investigators, and one of the judges in this case. It wasn't Cleveland, was it? No, no, no. But there was, there was, um, and and by the way, to be fair, it to call it pornography was questionable. I mean, but if it was on Jerry Sandusky's hard drive, I guarantee you it would have been considered pornography. My point is that this is common, but Jerry had none of it. Because Jerry's not a pedophile. If he is a sexual person, he's not a. He's certainly not a uh, an overtly uh, modern sexual person. I think when you learn more about his medical records, which we get into later on in the podcast, with the benefit of hindsight, you're, I think you're going to get lend more uh, uh, insight into what's really going on here. Because the medical records are probably the biggest mistake made by the defense that they were not. Uh, they were not part of the trial, but I, I would add also that to me, I connect pornography with the other things that are also always part of a serial pedophile payoffs and alcohol slash drug flying. Cause remember that so much of this doesn't fit that the narrative is contradictory, especially now that I know who all these settlement accusers are. I already knew who the, the eight, trial accusers were. I know almost all of, I mean, the names of all the settlement accusers, and I know their profiles of almost all of them. I have not found one shred of indication that any of these guys are gay. Now, that's politically incorrect to talk about, but that's a massive problem because a serial pedophile (laughs) who is engaging in male-on-male sex uh, first of all, is not going to be able to get away with targeting teenage heterosexual boys for 40 years without an incident, without any plying with drugs, without any plying of alcohol, without any payoffs. It's not possible. Not to mention, it destroys the entire narrative, which Jim Clemente, uh, who's you know, an infamous Hollywood uh, sec- quote, quote unquote sex crimes expert and who was hired by Scott Paterno to help write the Paterno report. He's claimed that Jerry Zadusky is one of the top 1% of all pedophiles because he was so good at getting away with this. Yet, how could he possibly be that good when out of all of his victims, he, didn't, he wasn't able to pick one kid that was gay? If you pick, if you pick if you, just one. Just pick one that's gay. Well, isn't that I, look? I'm like way out of my element here, but I, oh, come on! Don't give me some bullshit theory. This no, is, I'm still, asking you a this question. Is, this is about sex. You, you, this you, is you male are so on male. Jaded. You are so jaded. This is male on male sex. I, no, that's that is that is that is homosexual sex. Okay, that's fine. Can I ask a question, right, John? And then I, I promise I'll get you out of here. But just don't. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm honestly asking. Isn't 
wasn't that an element of the Catholic Church scandal where these priests targeted kids whom they thought were gay? Yes, that's yes. a huge element. That's right? that's part. I grew up in the Catholic tradition. I, I went to Catholic grade school, Catholic high school. I went to Georgetown, allegedly Catholic university. I, I've dealt with a lot of priests. Okay, the re, what people don't want to admit is that the reason why it's not it has nothing to do with being anti-homosexual. I couldn't care less if you're homosexual. But the reality is there is a higher percentage of priests who are homosexual than in the general population because priests can't be married. And so, especially in a, in a former generation, this was a great place for a gay man to go. This, there, was, there was nothing, you weren't giving up anything. So, of course, a large portion of the of the Catholic Church sex abuse scandal, and it was even in the movie Spotlight. I was amazed. Spotlight actually allowed this concept to be given credibility because it's very politically incorrect. The vast majority of these cases involving men on men were either boys that were gay or that the priests thought were showing signs of being gay. And why does that matter? Because they are not going to be repulsed inherently, by the advance. A heterosexual boy in central Pennsylvania, which might as well be rural Alabama when it comes to issues of homosexuality, is going to be beyond repulsed by just the concept of an older man making a sexual advance on a boy. And these were not seven-year-olds. These were 11 to 16 year olds. This, this, in which, you know, the prosecution was very cognizant. The, the, the it was, I've, I've, I have a theory that the two men who were running the prosecution, Frank Fina and Joe McGettigan, understood the problem with the ages because they were trying desperately to push down the ages at every possible turn. I mean, if you read Aaron Fisher's testimony. He's 11 for like three and a half years. I mean, he, he, he's like magically stays at 11 years old, uh, uh, because obviously at 12 and 13, uh, the world changes. Uh, and, uh, and the women in this story, and there are a lot, there are so many key women in this prosecution. Again, not has nothing to do with being against women. Women are looking at this, in my opinion, from the standpoint of a older male sexually assaulting them, which is a completely different set of circumstances than an older male sexually assaulting a heterosexual, effectively teenage boy. And so the women didn't understand the inherent absurdity of this allegation. I mean, any heterosexual man will tell you it is inherently absurd that a 13, 14 year old heterosexual boy is going to consistently go back to a male sex abuser with no payoffs, no alcohol, no drugs, no pornography, nothing. See, I don't know that intuitively. I would have to actually. Oh my God. Wait. We, oh my God. You get so disgusted so oh easily. God. I just say, I'm just saying, I don't know that intuitively. I don't know what the profile looks like. I don't know. You're that bad about me saying I don't know? Do you want me and to pretend fine. that no, I know? No, it's fine. It's I mean, fine. Lie and say, it's fine. Yeah, you're I, right. That I, is right. I don't know. I, I, I'm just saying I don't know. I'm not saying you're wrong. I, I think that Aaron Fisher, by the way, and I, not to open up a can of worms here, but I, I'm trying I, to get you out. No, I, I live I, here. No, you got to fly. I know. I, I know. I don't. We have to end this. But I, <laughs> I, I, one of the things we're going to address in the podcast with his with his wife Mallory is that um, I I think that there are. I have a theory about what really happened with Aaron that that relates to his fear that he might have been homosexual. That that that's I think might have been the the germ that that caused him to quote unquote feel comfortable, uncomfortable around Jerry. In other words, you know, Jerry and he are wrestling and you know there's a lot of physical contact in their relationship. I think it's possible that Aaron might have felt uncomfortable because he, you know, had some 
sexual reaction that freaked him out. I mean, hey. who knows? Well, I no, know we're in the, the no, conjecture. No, 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 no. This is based upon a conversation with his wife. But it's conjecture. It, it's how you're. It's how you're. It's, I, it's, a, cl- it's a theory. Are, yeah. Based upon um, speaking to a lot of people around Aaron Fisher, not and okay. not just not just I, around I, his I'm, wife. I'm putting my Jay but, Moore head on. I listened to your Jay Moore interview. <laughs> okay. he, he he kept trying to say, "Look, you got seventeen thousand facts that you know." Okay. I'm not saying don't well, bring pe- it up. People I, like to know what really happened here because well, I think there needs to be an explanation for why Aaron Fisher made f- told his mom. Jerry makes me feel uncomfortable. Your podcast is very popular. I, I mm. recommend it. Look, even if you disagree with your conclusion here, like if people disagree with you, I still think the coverage of it is fascinating. The story and the interviews. I, somebody could despise John Ziegler and find the episode where you have the Scott Paterno call fascinating. I mean, oh, just, it is fascinating. <laughs> just just for the the you know car crash aspects of it, like just that was hilarious. Again, they could find the the enjoyment of you getting yelled at by Scott Paterno if they hate you. I mean, your content sure. is just fascinating. You came all the way from L.A. to be here. Yeah. I respect you like hell for doing that. Obviously, we helped you get here, but I did not pay you to be here. Right. You right. are but, but I'll tell you what. You, you did a great job of getting me here. <laughs> you, you tried. Yeah. You're at the hotel I got married at, the Royal Park Hotel in downtown Rochester. Highly recommend. Not a sponsor, but they're wonderful. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to lay that out that, um, you know, for anyone asking, you were not paid a fee to be here. You just care this much. You were willing to give us your time. This is not just showing up for an interview or a, doing a phone interview for two hours. You essentially carved up your whole weekend to be here. And I, I just, I really appreciate it. And I thank you for being open-minded. And, um, and thanks for the hotel room. <laughs> no, no problem. No problem. With the benefit of hindsight is the podcast and framingpaterno.com is the website. Check him out. John Ziegler at Zygmunt Freud as well on Twitter. Um, look, I, I've had a, a large graduation with this guy going from thinking he's a, a nut that maybe he's on to something to, look, if I had a gun to my head right now, I think there is an innocent man in prison right now. And that's where I land. Um, and that's, uh, believe me. Five years ago, hearing myself say this, I would think I was a kook and I was an idiot. If anyone thinks I'm stupid, I am not going to push back because that was me. I was you five years ago. What I ask of of you is this, and this is where we'll end. You want to push back on John, anything John said, take him on on the basis of facts. Don't call him an asshole. Don't call him an idiot. Tell me where he's wrong, and I'm sure I'll hear about it. Please, I would love to know where I'm wrong. (laughs) Because I I tried, I I, I tried to debunk you in 2015 and 2016. I want my plan was to write an article for the website I used to work for at the time, calling you out about this. Impossible to debunk you, and I sent you a message a few days ago too. I said the thing with you, you're impossible to debunk anything about you, anything against you is an ad hominem. There's plenty of bad stuff written about you, but it's it's about your, you know. Character, ambiguous terms, what an asshole you are, what a firebrand has, all you are. There's, there's nothing in there substantive attacking your position. So I ask anyone to keep an open mind. Obviously, this is a Greek tragedy of Shakespearean mm-hmm. dimensions. If your conclusion is right, I think at the very, very least, on a procedural basis, on a constitutional basis, there was uh, an injustice here. Whatever you think of the crimes or alleged crimes being committed, this was a botched circumstance. So we thank you. John Ziegler for coming all the way from LAX. Just, uh, it was awesome to have you. Everyone should check out your content. I always say to my guests that I, that I like, Hey, I'd love to have you back. That's a tall order for you. <laughs> Maybe we can do it remotely next time, <laughs> okay. but um, I'm loving your content and right. uh, would love to have you back right. in some form. Thanks, Justin. John Ziegler. Thank you. Thank you to Ben Augusta, the great and powerful Oz on the other side of the wall. He's probably been holding in a very long bathroom break for for several hours because he was hitting the bottle before the show. So hopefully he didn't screw up too many of those switches back there, Ben. Uh, Eric Williamson sitting in his boxers on his couch at home. Thank you, our great set designer, graphic designer. Love you guys. Hey, if you're still with me at this point, uh, we appreciate that. We'll be back next week with more. This has been the Spiro Avenue Show. Justin Spiro, we'll catch you next time. Thank you.